All right. Good evening. This is a continuation of the Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday, June 7, 2016. We began our meeting in executive session. We'll continue now with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. As always, we begin our meeting with an opportunity for the public to address the board. Is anyone here this evening that would like to address the board of selectmen? Yes, sir. Name and address, please. Well, most sir. people know who you are. All right. Uh, Mike Whalen, 262 Wood Street. Um, I'm here uh, as the chairman of the Veteran Celebration Committee. Um, and on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank all the citizens of Hopkinton for uh, their participation uh, in the last Memorial Day here last, last week. And we had a little bit of a scramble because of the weather, and uh, it turned out just fine. We had a very large crowd. So um, and just here tonight, I want to thank just some of the participants who actually showed up here tonight, the old guard, uh, New England, who provided the gun salute over there, uh, Don McNeil and Dave Cardillo over there in, in attendance, as is uh, most of our Veteran Celebration Committee. I also want to thank the uh, high school band, the Scouts, St. John's Church, of course, for providing the venue, the uh, police department, who were, were going to help out if it was outside, but it turned to be inside, the fire department, who was in attendance, and that was well appreciated. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank the selectmen for those who attended, and John for his excellent speech. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I've been to uh, many of the Memorial Day celebrations since getting involved in town government. Not all of them. This was the first year I attended one inside, and uh, I really, I really could feel the emotion in the room that day. I thought it was a great uh, experience, and you guys did a great job. Thank you very much. Mr. Catino did an excellent job representing the board in the community, and thank you for your speech. It was really well done. Thank you, Mike. This is right. I just want to add a thank you. There were 10 citizens that came to Evergreen Cemetery later in the afternoon, and together of those 10 people, they cleaned 60 veterans' headstones, most of them well over 100 years old that had fallen in district here. Mm. And uh, it was a wonderful display of uh, really caring for our veterans and the amount of work that so thank you awesome. Okay, anybody else would like to address the board this evening? Another person that will have to state his name. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to the board, and uh, welcome to new members of the board. The um, reason I'm here, Mr. Chairman, is just I seem to have fallen out of the loop of the downtown revitalization. Um, I know a couple of years ago, it seemed to be the buzz. There was the DISC committee. There were public meetings. It seemed to be in the paper every week and kind of got an update of what was going on. I guess I fell out of loop because I really don't know what's going on. Um, I know there were some big projects. You know, they talked about taking the house at the corner of Wood Street, burying the lines, straightening out the intersection, the bike lane. I mean, all these things were thrown out, and I don't know where any of those stand. I don't know where the projects stand. So um, I know my time's short here. Your time's valuable up there. So I don't expect all the answers, but where would I or other residents go to get updated on where this project stands, what has been approved, what has not been approved, and what is the town looking for? Okay. Mr. Kamal. Thank you. Yes. Th thank you, in fact, for stepping forth and um, bringing this uh, issue to everybody's attention. In fact, at the board's uh, <coughs> next meeting, July 21st, uh, sorry, June 21st, town will provide an update on the project. Um, we also are beginning the phase uh, of conducting extensive public consultations 
which will lead to the public hearing process with MassDOT. Uh, and we will certainly uh, be looking for individuals who are willing to work with the town as well as with the chamber in, in, in sending this information out and we'll certainly be reaching out to you. <laughs> okay, so, so, so it's June 21st? Yes, June 21st we'll provide an update to the board. Very good, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Anybody else? Okay, seeing no more, we'll move ahead. Item number three on the agenda this evening is the consent agenda. We have some minutes from May 17th. We have a one-day liquor license uh, for King Philip Restaurant and Motel Incorporated doing business as Philip Catering of Phillipston, Mass. For the gun owner, Action League Cookout and Meeting to be held at the Hopkinton Sportsman's Association at 95 Lumber Street on Saturday, June 18th. We've got parade permits. There's one, two, three of them. Uh, parade permits for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Cycle for Life. That shows no road closures. Uh, a parade permit for the Ashland Lions Club for a bike triathlon. Uh, that shows no road closures. That's on Sunday, June 12th. And uh, the Mr. McIntyre, Dan McIntyre of Parks and Rec, for the July 4th Horribles Parade uh, on July 4th from noon to 1. That says no road closures, but uh, we can discuss that, I guess. And then finally, uh, well, two more things. Marathon fund requests, $1,000 for Babe Ruth for the purchase of uniform jerseys, $1,000 for the Hopkinton Patrolmen's Association for the purpose of repaying the association to stock the pond for the youth fishing tournament. And then uh, the other item here, a Hiller's pizza common victular license uh, for the Hiller's Pizza uh, to operate at the former location of Dino's Pizza. And then also a ban renewal, which is a bond anticipation note uh, in the amount of $200,000. Those are the consent agenda items. Does anybody uh, understanding that they are consent agenda items and straightforward want to break any of those out? I'm good. Everybody good? The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Mrs. Wright. Uh, the Hiller's Pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my understanding that they, according to an update that Maria sent to us, they have neither been to design a view or receive what they need from the building department. I'm less concerned about design a view than the building. So if they don't get, even if we approve it, if they don't have the building permit, they can't do the work anyway. So that would get sorted out at that department level. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Kamala? Yes. Okay. okay, so we have a motion on the table and a second for the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous and so carries. Item number four. And this is for 715, a public hearing to talk about trail names. So we're going to hold off until 715 uh, and come back to that at that time, uh, given that it is a public hearing. You good with that, Mr. Kamala? We'll skip over for now? Yes. OK. Oh, oh. Mr. Chairman, would it be possible to do the uh, 715 trail, um, at least for the Wellesville Trail um, now? So because it's a public hearing and we posted it as a public hearing, we have to hold it at the time posted. Uh, we can't do it before. We can extend it, but we got to open it at okay. 715. So okay. I appreciate if you have somebody Thanks. visiting with us tonight as part of the process. We'll get to it right at 715. We Perfect. can't go early. Okay. I'm sorry, sir. Did you? Uh, sorry, but I'm from Kim Hill Restaurant, so am I all set with that uh, one-day license? Yes, sir. Yes, that was in the consent agenda. Yep. Yes, you're all set. So uh, you want to speak with the woman behind you, Maria? She can help you out. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank Let's you. move to uh, item number five. The board of selectmen will consider accepting the resignation of Michael Restigini from the Upper Charles Trail Committee. I hope I got Michael's name correct. You did. You did. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion specific to Mr. Restigini's resignation? 
Move the board accept the resignation of Michael Restigini from the Upper, Tra Upper Charles Trail Committee. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Wesley, thank you to Michael for being a, 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 a strong member on the board and on that, that Trail Committee and to really is a, a, a board that's doing some great things in the time. Excellent. Anything else? Michael's a great guy. He's uh, put his heart and soul into that and into that committee. And <clears throat> I know he's got 100 kids and going a million different directions, and that's why he had to resign. So okay. we'll miss him. Maria, if you could do us a favor, please, and we could put a letter together. We'll send it out to, to Michael to make sure that. Yeah, okay, great. Excellent. All right, so we have a motion on the table and a second to accept the resignation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number six. The Board of Selectmen will consider appointing one member from the Board of Selectmen to the Elementary School Building Committee. Mr. Kamal, can you give us a little background on this committee, please? Yes. Um, pursuant to Mass General Law, um, the Selectmen uh, provide and a representative who, in fact, is a voting member to the Elementary School Building Committee alongside other town committees. Uh, so this in fact, is a position that requires full participation by the board. Uh, it's a project that is moved forward uh, very quickly, uh, and now we are reviewing the final designs as well as submissions to uh, the town permitting boards. Um, in terms of time requirements, uh, we meet uh, roughly perhaps once or twice a month. Um, members of the committee who are also members of uh, uh, working groups of the committee meet much more regularly. Again, this is a position that's required uh, by law and was previously held by uh, Mr. Moja. Is this a position that has to be a member of the Board of Selectmen or can it be a designee of the Board of Selectmen? Has to be a member of the Board of Selectmen. Has to be a member of the Board of Selectmen. So Mr. Moser, had he wanted to continue, unfortunately cannot. All right, so with that, anybody want to be on the elementary school building committee? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to say that uh, having been a member of a different elementary school building committee for a couple of years it can be a truly gratifying experience. Sounds However, like, sounds like you're not interested. <laughs> sounds like a sales pitch to me. <laughs> What's the time uh, commitment to that? You're probably looking at two hours twice a month. Maybe three hours twice a month. It's, it's the subcommittees, the work groups that start to take up more time. And I guess I'd just like to add, if anybody's interested in it, one thing to consider. Uh, you know, certainly when you go in, you need to kind of look around and get yourself familiar with what they've already done. They're on a, they're on a fast pace, and they've made a lot of decisions already. And um, I know they don't, they don't really have a timeline where they can slow down significantly so um, it's again I, I don't I don't like telling people how to approach things but you have to be kind of open to the decisions that have already been made and willing to kind of move on learn about them but continue to move forward uh, I don't have the time for this and as I said I've been a part of one of these for a couple of years in the past um, and so I'd prefer to give somebody else the opportunity but um, yeah, that's just some advice, I guess. I, I served on one 10 years ago before, and it never, that, that elementary school building didn't get built. It was before, you know, a long time back, even before the Fruit Street district discussion came up. Um, and the, the initial work, the siting, you know, the architectural selection of the architect, getting the job bid, all those things, that, and, the, and getting town meeting support, that was a huge lift for the committee at that time. Much of that work is done now, and now it's going to get into more of the actual construction of the facility. Uh, so if you're, if you're inclined to build things, now would be a time to jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that sort of development work uh, is behind us, and I think that will be more interesting for some. Anybody else have any thoughts? Anybody inclined to... Take the I would, uh, I could do it. You want to do it? Yeah. Can I call my wife and make sure it's cool? 
<laughs> we generally frown on asking yeah. spouses <laughs> oh. if they can go to another meeting. I yeah. actually had the, the uh, we all know the answer. <laughs> when the uh, element, when Elmwood School went through its remodel, uh, I was in high school, and the guy who was clerk of the works was uh, an old Hopkins guy named Fred White. I wouldn't expect many people here to know him, but sure. um, he kind of, we really had a lot to do with that, and it was pretty interesting. And where my kids are, uh, you know, seven and five now, it might be uh, interesting to be able to. Yep, yep, okay. Anybody Unless Claire else? wants it. Claire, if you want it, it's all Does you. Does anyone else have an interest in volunteering? <laughs> Everybody good? So we have a uh, volunteer stepping forward. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to nominate Mr. Ted Stone. Second okay. that. And now we have a nomination and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Ted Stone will be our representative on the Elementary School Building Committee. I have not gotten Thank any you, Mr. texts, Tedstone. so I'm good. <laughs> okay. A one day liquor license in seven minutes. I don't think so. Um, water hearing. I don't think so. <laughs> Solid waste recycling contract renewal in seven minutes. I don't <laughs> think so. I'd rather take Hard my chances with the liquor license. Hard review questionnaire. I don't think so. 15-year transfers request. Okay, Mr. Day. Caballo, I'd like to try and tackle item number 12 next, if that's okay with you. Um, the Board of Selectmen will consider approving the FY16 year-end transfer requests. Can you walk us through that, please? Yes. Um, in your packet, we included the listing of the transfer requests that we are asking the board to approve tonight. And also I'll share with the board that these are requests that have gone through the appropriations committee um, and received its approval. By way of introduction, mass general, uh, mass general laws allow for budget transfers at the end of the fiscal year. The key here being we're not increasing the budget was simply taking monies from one budget uh, center, redistributing them to another different uh, budget uh, uh, center. There are limits that are drawn uh, for such transfers, and, there is, and the transfers that are before you tonight uh, do meet the requirements of the law. Um, the other important highlight for us is uh, to share with you that the amount that we're requesting to transfer is within the limits uh, of the amounts that we've asked for in prior years. And in fact, that amount has been going down over the years. And then finally, uh, as, a, as, a, as a policy making board, uh, you may also want to look at this from the perspective of the town has done very well over the last years in terms of its free cash. And I can share with you that based on the current revenue projections, where we are, we may be able to continue that free trend where we are giving back a substantial amount back to uh, next year's budget process or to fund other uh, needs of the town going forward. So this is consistent with the law, doesn't change the amount of the budget, and the requests are within the limits that we have set for our side, ourselves internally uh, and are within the limits that we have uh, transferred over the last four or five years. Okay, why don't we start with Mr. Gattino? Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, Mr. Tedstone. I'm good. This is right. Nothing at this time. Mr. Sestari. Um, just a quick question, Mr. Kamalo. I noticed that one of the transfers is for um, some costs toward the town report. The transfer itself is small. Um, but every year when I look at the town report, and the number of hard copies of the town report we have, um, I'm sure the I'm sure the cost overall of printing that has got to be pretty high. And I know that there are legal requirements that we need to meet in terms of copies for every uh, registered voter or household or something to that effect. Um, but can we look into other ways of 
meeting that obligation and whether electronic copies are okay as long as we have hard copies for anybody who requests them or you know something like that because I would think that that's got to be some place where we can save ten or twenty thousand dollars or something yes um, that's an interesting point it's a conversation that I think will uh, uh, involve also the town clerk's office as well as the um, the, the our um, state agencies um, something worth looking into we will continue to investigate whether we can use electronic means to distribute the, the report. However, for the most part, we still get traffic coming into town hall asking for the hard copies. I'd be interested to hear how many extra copies we have at the end of the year. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, you know, I'd like to see how many extra copies we have at the end of the year, too. Yeah, just a thought. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Everybody good? Mr. Kamal, any other thoughts? No additional thoughts at this point. Okay. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the budget of FY16 year-end transfer requests uh, as submitted by finance director in the memo specific to transfer requests. So moved. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. It's unanimous and carries. Thank you. Okay, with that, and my watch says 7.15, but I know I'm two minutes early here. Uh, we'll go ahead in a minute and get ready for this public hearing. Um, just to kind of walk our colleagues through a public hearing process before we open it, because we'll open it right on time. This is where we vote to open the public hearing. Um, we have the uh, applicant or the proponent, whoever it is, make a presentation to the board, the board asks questions, and then we maybe have a little dialogue with the proponent. Then we go to the public and ask the public for their input since it's a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little bit of a, you know, the, the public, the open meeting laws are, are interesting. We have to meet in public and we have to meet in an open forum. But we don't, by law, have to take public input, meaning people addressing the board, unless we want to. A public hearing is a different scenario where you do, by law, have to take public input. So there's certain issues that get public hearings, there's other things that don't. Um, but you know, we try to be accommodating to everybody, but there's a, there's a little confusion sometimes about what's a public meeting and what's a public hearing. This will be a public hearing that we're going into now. Okay. So with that, the board's going to open a public hearing, or I'll t entertain a motion to open the public hearing uh, for the Mary C. O'Brien Pratt Trail and the Wells Wellzell Trail. Uh, the Board of Selectmen will hold public hearings on the request to name the following trails. The Mary C. O'Brien Pratt Trail, Northern Section, on the town's Fruit Street property, and the Wellzell Trail, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, a trail loop off the center trail. Uh, there are several supporting documents in the packet, uh, but the Chair will entertain a motion to open that public hearing, please. So moved. Second. And there's a second. Okay. With that, we'll ask that the Trails Committee and perhaps some of our friends uh, from other organizations in town make a presentation as to what they're doing uh, or requesting, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, Peter Lagoy, 21 Hayden Rose Street. I have with me Joe Carner. Where, are you? Where do you live, Joe? West Main Street. West Main. Um, and we're here as, uh, to, to request the Wellsville Trail be named. It's a small trail off of um, the Center Trail. Before I get started, um, I want to express appreciation for David Golden for letting me go ahead with the Wells Trail because um, I have the sixth grade band concert tonight between seven and nine. So <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. So you want to drag this on or what? No, I'm trying to move quickly. <laughs> We've um, all been there. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Joe was kind of spearheaded naming the trail. Initially, it was going to be named for Andy Wellsel, And then unfortunately, his sister Jane, who's a national class marathoner, died. And Joe can give a little more information on the family and why we feel it's appropriate to name the trail for them. Okay. Well, thanks, Peter. Good evening. Hi, Joe. Good evening. So this all started um, about six years ago. Uh, a citizen of the town, you know, a person who grew up in the town, Andy Wellsel, he passed away from pancreatic cancer. And Andy was a very unique individual. He was, um, he was uh, a running enthusiast. He lived, um, and his family still does, up on Hilltop. 
and he would, you'd see him around town all the time with a signature red bandana on his head, and he was just full of life, and he was always pointing out new trails for people to try and ways to connect runs, and he was just, he was a huge running enthusiast and just had a joie de vivre and just a life about him that was great. And so when he went down, you know, being into that sport a little bit myself, I said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could do something that would memorialize that, that kind of spirit. And with the town, you know, kind of using that as a brand these days, it just seemed like, you know, to have a native son, have a small little trail named for him, thought it was a good idea. You know, tragically, four years later, his, his sister Jane, who's, as Peter mentioned, national class marathoner, um, four-time Olympic trials participant, marath uh, women's marathoner of the year in 1990, um, just in, had an incredible record and, and run, always uh, was remembered as a Hopkintonian. She came back here many, many times to run races and stuff like that. Unfortunately, she also passed away from the same uh, um, disease that her, her uh, brother did, and it was just the pancreatic cancer. And it was just, it was, it was really a hard thing. And, and although things were going pretty well with the, with the trail at that point, it really put a lot more energy into it and everything else where people said, gee, you know, that's really amazing that we had these two great representatives to, you know, to, to put forward as, as, you know, running representatives of the town. And, and, uh, and so that's why we're here tonight, just, just to try to memorialize the, you know, the, the efforts of these two people to, to bring running more into the mainstream and, and all the work that they did in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before we go to questions, Mr. Kamalo, can we sort of separate or split the question here and address and stay in public hearing but also vote on this trail so that Mr. Lagoy can go do what he's got to do, or do we have to close the public, public hearing before we can vote on this particular trail? You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I think we have to treat both as a group because that's how the public hearing was opened. Yeah, okay. So we but can't split both, the question. Both, Got it. Okay. Just, just checking. Okay. Uh, thank you for that input. Uh, full disclosure, Mr. Carner and I have run before in the past. Uh, he is wicked fast, uh, as they say. So I don't think I'll be running on this trail with him because he is wicked fast, but he's a great guy to run with. Um, Mr. Ted Stone. Uh, I think this is great. The Wellsell family is a wonderful family. I, I read a nice letter from Mark Stickney in support of this, and uh, I know that area like the back of my hands I grew up in that the end of Chamberlain Street so I've been I've been out uh, I did it off the record I guess on the record I packed down all those trails this year with my snowmobile so uh, so Thank all you. you guys can use them in the winter yeah so no thanks necessary I'm glad to do it um, but it's a good uh, I think it's great Mr. Catino yeah this is you know this is exactly um, Type of family and type of individuals that, that trails should be named after. People that actually use them and uh, trailblaze them. And um, so I, I'm at full support. This is right. No, it's a great little trail. I've walked a number of times myself. I was kind of wondered why there was just a stick of the ground with a piece of paper stuck on it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I like the idea that we put some signage up on our trails to let people know they're just not on some trail in the woods going through somebody's yard or private property. So I think we should be marking our trails. And the story of the Wellsville family um, couldn't, put, couldn't have a better idea. I fully support yeah. this. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I can't say that I know of the Wellsles, but in reading uh, what's in the packet, you know, it seems like a touching story, and I'd say that they're lucky to have uh, friends and supporters mm. like you. And uh, it's great when we can have people with um, the, the real institutional memory in town and, and connections in town from longer ago uh, than, than just the past decade or so uh, bring these things to light so that we can make sure that these people are commemorated. Thank you, Tom. It's a great trail. It's a great spot in town. I've run it couple times already and really enjoy it and I think this is a fantastic way to honor their lives so um, with that we'll thank you folks for that input and we'll ask Mr. Goldman to join us for another trail naming um, Peter I think you're all set so if you got to do your thing you'll be fine thank you uh, we have another trail that Mr. Goldman's going to present to us now
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Board of Selectmen, welcome, Mr. Ted Stone. Welcome, Claire. Uh, it's nice to see uh, some new faces on the board. Not that the old faces were a problem, but anyway, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, the Fruit Street property and the conservation restriction that's on that property shared by Halt and by SVT and talk about naming <clears throat> another section of, a tr of the trails. Um, is there anybody that's going to operate the... the... The board has the, the, the material. Okay. I don't know why I did the presentation, though, but nevertheless. Um, the... Uh, in your packets, there are five slides. The first slide describes the conservation restriction in itself and defines the conservation area in green. Um, that conservation restriction was put on, I think, about two or three years ago. Since that time, we have, along with Sudbury Valley, erected <clears throat> a sign along the uh, road that goes into the uh, athletic fields that defines the Fruit Street Conservation Area. And we have opened the trail on the southern side of the, of the um, open space. And that trail um, has uh, signage as well in two locations. One is on the loop road uh, or on the input road about halfway to the um, athletic fields. The other sign is uh, at the uh, gate to the wastewater treatment facility. The second slide in the packet defines all the trails that are in the Fruit Street properties that are on the conservation restriction. What the HALT and SVT would like to do <clears throat> is to name the northern section trail, so, well, let me put it this way. The southern section trail is named the Mary C. Pratt uh, Trail Southern Section. So in keeping with that, we'd like to name the northern trail sections the Mary C. O'Brien Pratt Northern Section Trails. And I've put up in your packets signage that shows the southern section actual signs and the proposed sign for the northern section trail. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sestari. Um, I do not have any questions. This is right. I don't have any questions, but I know the first part of the trail. It makes total sense to me to name the other half uh, Mary Pratt as well. Well, the other reason why we would like to do that is that the northern section trails will abut the property that now the town owns the old Pratt Farm and subsequently in future years I expect there will be trails in that p property as well so the trails can continue on into the Pratt property. Mr. Tedstone. I'm good. Mr. Catino. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, for the great slides. It, it makes, makes the job so easy. Thank You're you. welcome. We try to make it easy. I had, uh, I had the great honor of sitting there for a year or two. And Mrs. Pratt sat here for a couple of years. And uh, strange as it was to some in town, we became a voting block. And uh, we had great fun here on the board. Uh, no one, uh, I don't think, has worked as hard to protect the trails and develop the trails in Hopkinton uh, than Mrs. Pratt. Uh, she did a fantastic job in that regard. And uh, I think this is very fitting to name this trail after, after Mrs. Pratt. Uh, I hope she's watching. Uh, we miss her on the board. Uh, every now and then I'd have to write her a little note to tell her to behave. <laughs> I'd slip it to her and she'd scribble something back that I won't repeat and slip it back to me. Uh, but she was fa a fantastic uh, Board of Selectmen member and a true advocate for our outdoor community here in Hopkinton. And uh, I, I'm really excited to vote for this trail name for Mrs. Pratt. Good. Yeah. In, in, in passing, I will say that Mary has served on our board of directors 
of the trust for, she was the founder of the trust, along with four, of, uh, four others of us, and she served and still serves on the board uh, of the trust as a director. Unfortunately, she's not been active for the past two years because she's been off in a, a nursing home um, in Natick. And we're probably going to uh, elect her as a director emeritus very shortly. Great. Great. Well, I happen to see Mrs. Pratt every single five days a week. And um, Mrs. Pratt is, she was instrumental on helping me get onto the board of selectmen. And uh, I will double your sentiment. We weren't on TV, but she has comments on everything. And they're, they're pretty fun comments. So great I fun. think this is great to, to be able to see. You know, uh, the, the, the first uh, handful of years after uh, she was no longer on the board, I would talk to her and you know, there was a period where she was coming to the meetings and then she stopped and I'd call her up every few months and I'd say, you know, Mary, we miss you at the board meetings. You know, how come you're not coming? You got to stop by and visit. Just, you people are boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's not even entertaining anymore. <laughs> but she had, but she had and, and still has, I'm sure, such integrity. Mm. Uh, you know, I was, I was in the election with her and there was one point where somebody had taken one of my lawn signs from one place and put it on somebody else's lawn and they pulled hers up and removed it so it made the person look like they were supporting me rather than Mary. And uh, you know, the person put all sorts of signage around it with arrows saying, don't vote for this person, <laughs> pointing to my sign. And, and Mary was the first one on the phone calling me up saying, I just want to let you know, I'm sure you didn't put your sign on that guy's lawn, but you know, this is happening and you should probably give him a call. And you know, she wasn't interested in any kind of right. uh, you know, chicanery, I guess. Uh, you know, she just wanted good things to happen and, and an even playing field for everyone. And, and uh, I miss seeing her around. Absolutely. Well, I saw Mary recently. I gave her blow by blow descriptions on how to watch the selectmen's meeting online. So, Mary, you better be watching. <laughs> I thought that was Mrs. Pratt calling right now to tell me something. <laughs> I, I, I will stop talking I wouldn't about doubt me. it. <laughs> Mary, I, I, wouldn't I, I can. If she texts, that would be a lot of fun. She can text them I can tell you that Mary will be watching it at about 11.15 tonight. Right. Yeah, good. <clears throat> well, please tell her we said hello, yep. and uh, I think it's just a great, great honor for her. Anything else, Mr. Goldman? Yeah, if the board is so inclined to, to grant this request, uh, I would have one request, Mr. Tedstone, that you print the slides that I have offered in support of this and give them to Mary. I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. No problem. She'll have them in her hand by 11. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kamalo, any thoughts? In fact, um, it's very uh, befitting and appropriate that the first two applications to come through uh, the town's recently approved asset naming process are the ones that the board is discussing tonight. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it's been a great pleasure for staff working with the uh, two proponents. The information that they provided for us was quality information. Um, and also, what I enjoyed uh, throughout this process was uh, testing the whole idea of a public hearing process and, and, and notifying abutters. Uh, it was pretty, it, it, a pretty interesting challenge uh, identifying abutters for the Foot Street uh, request. However, we, we did circulate the information to some of the abutters, uh, realizing the significance of the parcel as well as the significance of the uh, name suggested. Uh, I also uh, want to acknowledge the, the letter that was included in the packet uh, for uh, the other trail, I, I thought the, the, we want to thank the, the resident for taking their time uh, in putting together that thoughtful letter. Great. Yeah. I think these are two great actions that we have an opportunity to yeah. move on. Um, okay, so with that, is there anyone from the public that would like to offer any input specific to the trail namings in front of us? Okay, so seeing no public input, uh, I think it's appropriate then to entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So second. second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion? I should say any discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the public hearing is now closed and the Board of Selectmen in its next step will, quote, deliberate. Um, 
or we can move forward with a motion and uh, take our action. I have no nothing to deliberate. I would be surprised if we had any discussion on this to not move forward as moved. Well, that could jinx it right there. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now that you said that. Uh, fair enough. Okay, so the board will entertain a motion to approve uh, the naming of the two trails brought, brought before us this evening, specifically the Mary C. O'Brien Pratt Trail Northern Section on the town's Fruit Street property and the Wells L Trail, a trail loop off the center trail um, in the center of town. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Congratulations to Mrs. Pratt and the Wellzell family for their contributions to Hopkinton, and please give them our best. And please, obviously, let the trails and the running club know what's going on. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great night. Okay. We've taken care of number five. We've taken care of number six. We can move to item number seven now. Uh, with the understanding that we've got our next public hearing at 8 p.m. <clears throat> uh, so I think we can get through this one-day liquor license between now and 8 p.m. And then we'll do uh, that public hearing and move on to some other items. So item number seven on our agenda, the Board of Selectmen will consider a one-day all-alcoholic beverages li liquor license from Cary Paradise of 10A Church Street, Hopkinton, to be held at St. John the Evangelist Church at 20 Church Street, Hopkinton, on Saturday, June 25th, from 5.30 to 11 p.m. It's my understanding that this application is for a wedding that will be a wedding ceremony or, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reception. Reception, thank you, uh, following a wedding at St. John's. Mr. Kamalo. Yes, the request as described by the chair was circulated to town permitting departments for comments. Uh, we did not receive uh, any adverse comments. Uh, the comment of note is from the police department. Uh, they are requiring that all servers be TIP certified. Uh, no alcohol is to be consumed or taken off premises uh, and that there will be adequate uh, staffing to ensure that any person under 21 has no access to alcohol. Uh, and the police department is available to meet with the parties uh, to explain uh, any details regarding this plan. Okay. Is the applicant here by chance or a representative of the applicant here by chance? Hi, would you mind joining us at the podium for a minute? Sure. If you could share with us your name. My name is Barbara Burnham. I'm the bride's mom. Hi, Barbara. How are Hi. you? Fine, thank, thank you. you for coming tonight. Thank Do you, you want to just kind of us. fill us in from your perspective on this application specific to St. John's? Um, it's for June 25th for my daughter's wedding. The, wedding, the ceremony is going to take place at 5 o'clock outside, and then the reception is to follow in St. John's Parish Hall. The um, company that will be um, serving the alcohol and providing the alcohol is fully insured, and also their staff is entirely um, TIP certified. Okay. Uh, so how many people will be attending the wedding, if you don't mind my asking? Um, right now it's looking at um, somewhere between 150 to 160. It's always nice how it comes down to the last minute and you're trying to yeah. figure it out, right? So 150 to 160 people. Okay. And Mr. Kamal, you, and, and Barbara, just bear with us while we go through some of this because we have to make sure we get this right. Uh, Mr. Kamal, you said something about how they're going to make sure no one under 21 is served? Yes, and that's a request that came from the police department. Specifically, they are requiring that there be adequate staffing to ensure that that does not happen. So how do we define adequate staffing for a wedding of 150 people? If it's okay, the chief is here to answer the question, Mr. Chair. Chief Lee, welcome. Okay, if the, uh, the staff, I assume that the caterers yes. and the bartenders mm -hmm. and the, the waiters, if they're all uh, TIP certified, uh, you know, I imagine with that amount of people, there they, should be about... They, uh, there's at least five bartenders and they're all TIP five certified. Five bartenders, it's going to be a heck of a party. <laughs> 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 that should be more than sufficient. 
St. John's has had these one-day licenses numerous times in the past, so they get it. St. John's does. Um, but I don't know if this organization or this big company that's coming in to cater uh, and staff the bar has been there before or not. Um, just let them know, you know, we got to run this thing by the books. It's got to be 21. If they're not 21, no way, no how. That's right. You know, typical, you would expect. Um, we don't, are we going to have an officer over there by chance? Do we need to have an officer there? Okay. They'll just be aware of that event in town at that time. Yeah. Okay. And is there a band or a music venue as part of the? Um, there'll be a DJ as well. DJs are fun. DJs are great. We're putting the playlist together now, so. What kind of cake are we having? <laughs> um, actually, my daughter's daycare provider is um, making her cake for us. Um, she's a town resident as well. Excellent. Nancy Mercer. I understand you'll be having uh, representation from Fort Wayne, Indiana. At there this will wedding. be representation from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Forky Absolutely. Tyler. Okay. Uh, all right. So, does anyone else have any questions specific to the request? Why don't we start with Mr. Tesla? Any other questions? No. Uh, it looks pretty good from everything that I see and everything that I know. Okay. I have no issues. Mr. Tino. No Is this little Courtney? Carrie. Oh. Courtney's next year. Courtney's next, next June. <laughs> I know these brides. Um, I, I, I'm new to this, this liquor licensing stuff, but I have to make the assumption that where they are hiring a professional um, cocktail company, cocktails raising the bar, they know what they're doing. This is this is their business. So yes. um, I, I I don't have any problems with this. No, just wish the bride and groom many happy years. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thank you very much for coming. So. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve the license. Second. OK. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous, and so carries. All set. You'll get your license through the town manager's office. Mr. Kamal, is that they'll come through? Maria? Yes, please okay. contact Maria in your office. She'll be happy to help you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Please your, wish your daughter the best. Best wishes. And her, and her future husband. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, we have a public hearing at 8 o'clock on the sewer rates. So we'll come back to that. Uh, we were scheduled, uh, you know, roughly at 8.30 to talk about the solid waste recycling contract renewal process and renewal itself. I think we could probably tackle that now, or try to anyway, and then we'll come to our public hearing at 8 o'clock. So if we move to item number 9, Mr. Kamal. Mr. Chair, how about if we move to item number 10? Mr. Kamal would like us to move to item number 10. Mr. Sestar, are you okay with doing that? Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah, whatever. Okay, we'll move to item number 10, per Mr. Kamal's request. Um, the Charter Review Committee questionnaire. The Board of Selectmen will review the questionnaire from the Charter Review Committee. Mr. Kamala, you want to walk us through this, please? Yes, uh, and, and Mr. Sestari, feel free to, to jump in because Mr. Sestari is uh, the board's representative on the Charter Review Committee. Uh, this is a list of questions uh, put together by the Charter Review Committee and shared with town boards, committees, and town staff. Um, we, we felt that it was important that we bring this questionnaire to the board's attention. Uh, it's focusing on issues and challenges that the board may have faced in implementing the current charter, uh, the budget process, um, as well as comments on elected versus appointed positions uh, in the town charter. Uh, there is also a request for any uh, comments or suggestions with regard to uh, likely revisions to, to the Charter. Again, the Charter Review Committee is in the process of seeking information. Um, there will be uh, further public hearings to be held by the com uh, uh, committee. Uh, sub the, the end game here is to identify areas for strengthening the Charter 
bring those to a town meeting and subsequently to a, uh, a, a town-wide vote. Okay. Mr. Sestori, anything to add to that? I think that Mr. Kamala summed it up pretty well. Um, the Charter Review Committee has been meeting since January. Uh, and in the last, I'd say, month and a half to two months, it's uh, we've gotten to a point where the Charter Review Committee put together this questionnaire. Uh, as Mr. Kamala mentioned, they distributed it to the various committee chairs uh, and department heads looking for input. And they've also been inviting people uh, to come to the meetings to uh, go through their input. And so they've been going through, uh, you know, they'll, we'll, we'll talk to anywhere from four to five different <coughs> committee and department heads uh, in a meeting. Uh, we've done that for the last three meetings. This was actually sent out, I want to say it was at the beginning of April. Um, but unfortunately, we were going head first into the budget and town meeting preparation. And so the, uh, uh, the former chair uh, never had an opportunity to bring it in front of the board for discussion. Um, so at this point, uh, we'd just like to, I say we as the Charter Review Committee, would like to get the Board of Selectmen's feedback. And uh, as we're putting that feedback together, I guess, um, you know, if it's okay with the board, I'd be fine with representing the board's views at that meeting or if the chair or vice chair would uh, rather go to represent the board and its opinions, that's fine as well. Okay. So specific action requests for this evening, is it to approve the questionnaire or just offer input on the questionnaire? It's to offer input. Okay. All right. With that, do you have any input you want to offer as a Board of Selectmen member? Well, you know, um, so I get to, I'm lucky because I get to, uh, uh, in effect, take two bites at the apple here, I guess. And, uh, you know, I can, I can contribute to the conversation here and have a vote in what the board's view is in terms of uh, direction or, or comment on these various questions. And then when I'm also down in the Charter Review Committee, obviously we have our own discussions around these questions as well. Uh, the Charter Review Committee has not taken votes or stands on any issues at this point. We're still trying to get input. Uh, we've, we've given various options and some opinions and things of that nature, but no formal votes uh, on anything. Uh, so I guess my preference would be to uh, let the rest of the board kind of offer their input on the various questions. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to give my input as well, but uh, I, I don't think I'd prefer to, I guess, direct people or, or drive the conversation uh, from an opinion standpoint. Anyway. Okay. Mrs. Wright, do you have any thoughts on the questionnaire? Um, not at the moment. It looks like a good questionnaire. Pretty thorough. Should we go through qu one question at a time and, and see if the board has comments? You want to do it that way? Sure. Time? We can do that. Do you want to walk us through that? Sure. So the first question is, have you encountered problems or issues with the rules in the current town charter that, if, that have affected your ability to do your job? If yes, please explain in detail. Uh, so, you know, I guess, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, difficult, it's difficult to approach this without, uh, I guess, kind of going through the town charter itself, but uh, I'm not sure if any of my fellow board members and and certainly this is something where uh, I think even even events that might have happened when you weren't on the Board of Selectmen, uh, you know, are, are, are certainly valid. Mm -hmm. uh, but has there ever been a time where you've wanted to get something done and someone has said, ah, I can't do that, you know, it's <laughs> town charter prevents us from doing that. So do you want those specific, you think of look, looking for those specific examples tonight? I thought we were looking at just the questions and sort of the frame of the questionnaire. If that's another option is, is going through the questions and giving people uh, something to study between now and the next meeting. Mr. Kamal, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it may be helpful for, for the board to perhaps identify in very general terms um, what the answers could be uh, to, to these questions. For, for example, I, I, I can also help the board um, 
by way of identifying some issues that board members have brought to my attention. Um, for, for example, I think with regard to number one, um, one of the um, challenges that the board has faced is that provision uh, regarding who has authority uh, in overseeing the licensing process in town. Clearly, that's something that needs to be fixed. Okay. Yes. Um, we have, the board has also in the past, and I think this ties in with question number three, has in the past uh, discussed some of the constraints and limitations regarding the, the budget timelines, uh, as well as uh, the, the general question as to who has uh, oversight over the town meeting warrant process. Okay. Any other big ones jump out at you? Yeah, I think the, there's also been discussion in the past regarding how we better align the schedules for town meeting with the budget timeline. Yeah. Um, there has there's also been questions with regard to um, perhaps the need uh, to have an established process for um, for for managing board reorganization processes, uh, namely whether chairs should rotate or not rotate. Um, there have also been discussions in the past uh, with regard to um, the organization of, 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 of staffing here at, 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 at Town Hall. So specific to the board chairs piece, for the board of selectmen, there is in the charter specific language as to how, when, and how long people can serve as chair of this particular board. That's actually not in the town charter. That That's in um, the handbook. Our, yeah, our, our own Oh, that's handbook. in the operating <coughs> Yeah, the procedures. rules of procedure. I got you. Okay, thank you. All right. So maybe it needs to go to the charter. And that's, yeah, that's want to further codify it. Yeah, that's one suggestion is that, uh, you know, all boards have some, lim you know, kind of term limit on, on uh, the position of chair uh, or, or something to that effect. Yeah, I, I like the idea of having that in the charter, taking it from our board, our policies and procedures and putting it into the charter, but not just for this board, for all boards. I think a two-year maybe limit, term limit, and then a year off, and then you can come back, but no more than two years at one uh, consecutive years at a time, right? Something and, along those lines. And there have been and there have been members of other boards who have raised concerns, saying that they're members of boards that, um, you know, people are happy to serve on the board, but nobody wants to be chair. <laughs> and the person who is chair, you know, is maybe the only one, or even that person is there, you know, in the position itself reluctantly. Uh, you know, other people say that in order for their board to uh, continue progress on various issues they feel that it's important for a person to be in that position for more than two years and, and things of that nature so there are arguments against it as well um, you know personally I'm, I'm in favor of the limitation uh, and saying you know two years in a row is enough then let's give somebody else a chance if you come back after that year off then then great you know but you get another two years and then take another another year off mm -hmm. what if That's no one else wanted point. it I'm sorry. What if no one else wanted it? You could address that. Yeah. In in the, I mean, so there is there is language in the in that handbook that it's a two year and then it goes to a vote if you're uh, if you wanted more than whatever the whatever the maximum was, it would go to the vote for the uh, the board to vote. Hmm. Um. So. So term limits in general into the discussion for the tar charter review that is coming out of this board. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally like term limits for office holders as well. I'm a big mm -hmm. term limits person. Um, I think what goes on in Washington, D.C. is a great example of why we need term limits at all levels of government. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I would love the idea of term limits for selectmen at maybe four terms and planning board members at two or three term. I mean, I like that idea. So that would be something I'd put out there as one member. Clearly, if somebody wants to be on this board for more than two, four terms, they're crazy. We need to limit them because there's something they're going crazy. on there. <laughs> <laughs> and they shouldn't be. I'll just name them at midnight. Every <laughs> so I think term limits is an interesting idea in general, just the overall concept of term limits. We can't solve that here tonight, but that's one another thought. Another thing, another thing that we've discussed is, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to get together uh, uh, somewhat of a hierarchical chart that shows all the different committees and boards in town 
and their relationship to other committees and boards. So which ones, uh, you know, report directly to them, you know, looking at, looking at, I guess, kind of the decisions that they're making and the jurisdiction of each and trying to create more of a definition of, okay, if you're on board A, you can't be on board B too, you know, because there's a conflict there. There have been situations in the last couple of years where we've said, you know, if you're here and you're here, you're getting two votes on the same issue, much like what I just described, actually. And, you know, <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting two bites at the apple there. Um, and so, you know, there, there are scenarios like that that we've discussed as well. Sure. So. I like the idea specific to the budget process uh, of having a joint budget committee where we have a five-member or seven-member joint budget committee uh, through from Jan that meets from November 1 to March 31 before we submit to appropriations uh, and that committee is comprised of two members of the board of selectmen two members of the school committee two members of the appropriations committee and maybe somebody else um, something or a member of the board of selectmen and the town manager a member of the school committee and the superintendent we did that as an ad hoc uh, organization a few years back but I like the idea of doing that in a more formal way to bring a more uh, one town, one solution approach to the budget process. Um, so something like that I'd like to throw into the mix uh, under budget topics. Yep. Any other thoughts and other things people want to put in? We've talked about the election thing before. Mm -hmm. uh, so the board, this, the board of selectmen, perhaps not this board, the board of selectmen has weighed in on um, elected versus appointed for town clerk. And uh, well, the DPW we resolved in the past. What other ones were there? Well, some of the highly technical ones are, are ones that uh, should be looked at, um, where um, policy comes from a uh, from a knowledge base that uh, uh, may not come from a, from a uh, general populace. That you know, we might need somebody that's. Uh, uh, more learned in a in a specific field. But which offices would that be? Uh, board of Health is another one. When it comes to uh, septic systems and that kind of stuff. Um, because uh, you know they're 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 ruling on um, whether or not a. Uh, Can you speak up, Mr. Catino. Oh, sorry. I, no, I just can't hear you over here. Oh, sorry. No, whether or not that uh, you know a. a um, uh, a, a proponent gets uh, relief if they're putting in another bedroom or they're, they're putting it in a basement and whether or not that the, that the tight restrictions when it comes to septic systems, whether or not they get relief and they're allowed to, to actually put this addition on without having to update their whole septic system. You know, that, that sometimes can take uh, some uh, uh, deep thinking. So would you be are you suggesting that the Board of Health be appointed as opposed to elected? I don't know if we could do that particular board that way. I think well, that, I, yeah, I think that that type I think that that type of change uh, requires a, a longer process than than the typical changes we discuss, and it's not something that our our group is closed to. Uh, but that might it, be a Mass like General a Law process. controlled board. Do you know if that's the case, Mr. Kamala? Um, not, not necessarily. Uh, they are appointed boards of health and elected boards yeah, of health. So they're right. appointed but I think versus to Mr. Sister's point, it, it takes a much longer uh, and sustained discussion to, to get to that type of a change. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Some of the other, some of the other things that uh, you know, have been discussed have been around, uh, as Mr. Kamala mentioned, the organization of town hall. So one of the things that we've done, you know, as we're reading through the town charter and we're, we're reading the, the forward, um, you know, it talks about one of, the, one of the intents of the town charter was to bring in a more centralized professional form of government so that we can prepare for the town's growth. And so right now we're... we're the town is somewhat in this position where we've got one foot on the platform and one foot on the train. And an example uh, that I'm thinking of is when there's a, a paid position in town hall uh, that is appointed by a board or a committee, um, 
and now that employee is working within town hall and Mr. Kamalo is town manager, he's, he's in the town charter as having authority over the organization of town hall. And you get, a situ you get situations where not all boards and committees um, have, have the time, bandwidth, whatever, desire, wherewithal, I don't know what it is, to give that, uh, that direction that's needed over that town employee. When it comes to uh, working on things like the budget, and things of that nature, it often falls greatly onto Mr. Kamalo's uh, shoulders to help the employees, and he doesn't complain about it. I mean, he understands. It is part of his job. It's something that we expect him to do, helping the person through the budget, helping them through uh, various day-to-day -day, uh, components of their job. Uh, and then in the end, um, you know, it's, it's one of these kind of dotted line connections in theory, but there's no official dotted line there. So it can, it can end up being a difficult situation at times where uh, Mr. Kamalo is, is responsible for the success within town hall from all angles, uh, and yet not all the employees are necessarily uh, under, his, under his umbrella or under his organization. Um, and so that's something that we've discussed in the Charter Review Committee, uh, you know, and you can, you know, quote unquote, solve it if you think that there's a problem uh, a couple of different ways. And, you know, one way is to say, well, this person strictly reports to this board or committee. Now you're kind of going counter to what the intent of the charter was. Uh, or you could say, well, yes, this, this group, they do have the authority or they, they have uh, input or they still have the authority to hire a person, but that person reports to the town manager or a different manager that reports to the town manager or something to that effect. Um, you know, does it, does it create huge problems on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I, I don't know that it does that. Mr. Kamala would probably know better. Um, have we run into issues? where it's created tricky, tricky uh, situations here and there. Uh, you know, I'll say that, yes, we have. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that not necessarily our board, but the town needs to decide, you know, is this something that we want to leave as status quo or do we want to nudge in one direction or the other to resolve the issue? It's very common in the private sector, anyway, to have matrix reporting structures. You know, you've got dotted lines that are pretty firm dotted lines, but that's still, you know, sort of management by committee uh, in, 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 in many of the cases. Even in those situations, though, ultimately there is somebody towards the top of that structure that has a final say. If there's a conflict down below in that matrix structure, somebody has the final say. And I think that's what we probably need to work towards yeah. is we're going to have, uh, it, I think, a healthy dialogue and sort of internal debate about getting some things done. But, you know, if, it, if, it, if, if we stall or it becomes a problem, then the town manager, in my view anyway, steps in and makes the determination, and that's the deal. Um, so something along those lines is, I think, what you're describing. That's kind of what I would support anyway. Functional management versus program management, that yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. So something along those lines, I think. Yeah, for, and, for I think, and I think also that um, in the past it was made more difficult because, uh, you know, Mr. Kamala was taking on – uh, well, basically, he was taking everything on himself uh, from the town manager's office, and now that uh, you know there is there is a role in there to lend support to him, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that can also help the situation where these various boards and committees, uh, you know, in theory, can can have a stronger relationship with the town manager's office uh, as as we're moving forward on this. Okay. Any other topics people want to put out real quick for the? Uh, Charter Commission or committee to consider? Yeah, I just, we touched on this a little bit with Board of Health. Certain committees that require a particular level of professional expertise on occasion. If you look at something like the Board of Health and it's only a three person board, um, and there are times, more often than not, they're dealing with things like septic issues, but occasionally there is a medical issue and um, I don't know whether that board brings in outside consultants or whether we always have the in-house capabilities between the health agent um, to 
to answer those questions. I, I just, um, I know years ago, before the charter, when we first moved to town, my husband, as a, as a physician, was what they called an associate member. And I don't know that he attended all the meetings, but I think uh, he was sort of an adjunct member that was there to provide assistance if it was a medical issue. Um, you know, you could get into a situation where you have three people that run for that board, none of which really have the specific training to the kind of a health issue that's being dealt with. Um, are those boards, Board of Health is the one that comes to mind, but a board where there's some specific professional expertise sometimes required in their decision making, um, something we might look at expanding the membership into a second tier, like an associate membership or something to make sure that they have ready access to the level of professional expertise when it's called on. Let me, excuse me, if I could just jump in real quick. Uh, it's 8 o'clock. I want to open this public yeah. hearing and we'll continue this. We'll, yeah. we'll continue the hearing in one sec. So the chair will entertain a motion to uh, open the public hearing for the fiscal year 2017 water and sewer rates public hearing. Uh, pursuant to the special act establishing the Department of Public Works in Hopkinton, the Board of Selectmen will set the water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2017, effective July 1, 2016. I'll entertain a motion to open up the public hearing for that specific purpose. Second. So we have a motion and a second to open a public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the public hearing for the water and sewer rates is now open. Uh, as the chair, I'll continue that until such time as we finish our current discussion. Mr. Sestari. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess for me personally, um, I, I look at the different situations and I make some distinctions. And in the case of the Board of Health, A, I look at the fact that it's, it's a board, so there are multiple people contributing to decisions. Uh, B, it's a volunteer board. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, these people are volunteering their time and they're not getting paid. And C, there's also a director over there who does lend the professional component, just as for this board, we have a professional town manager uh, who's able to guide us from a professional level. Um, where, my, where my greatest concern is uh, in terms of elected versus appointed, and please take no offense, <laughs> um, is, is an area such as town clerk where we are electing someone and the person is getting paid a salary to do something where there are a lot of rules and regulations and laws within the state that need to be complied with. Um, so for us to, for we may, we may hit it lucky and every time we have to elect a town clerk, we might get the best damn town clerk on earth. And that's great. Um, but then there could be other situations where we elect a town clerk and the person uh, is, is not capable of doing the job. And so now we have somebody who has gone out to hopefully an educated vote, um, but possibly you know just a, a popularity vote. And the person is bringing in a salary for three years. And the only person they answer to is the voters. And it's a heavy lift for the voters to do anything within that three years. So now your next opportunity is at the three-year mark. But in the, in the meantime, there's three years in that position with a person who may not be capable of doing the job well. So that's, that's kind of where my concern lies, uh, more, than, more than the volunteer boards. Are there not any, I'm sorry, uh, are there not any checks and balances on those where if that person is not doing their job or not doing their job, job at a level that's uh, commiserate to what they're getting paid or, or what the job entails, isn't there a, a check and balance in there where uh, whether it be the town manager or the board of selectmen or someone can start a process to look into that and then possibly remove that person? To my knowledge, the voters can start a process, uh, but there is no single Call. position that can start a process. Okay. Yeah. And, and, or, just, I have a different subject. If, if, um, so we good on this subject for now? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, mine was uh, one of the things that, that I run into uh, on Zach is that many times it's a, it's, a, it's a board that came through the planning board, yet many times some of the issues that come up are not um, zoning 
changes, but actual bylaw changes. And real bylaw changes have to come through the Board of Selectmen. So one of the things that um, uh, we should be looking, we may, may look at is where Zach reports to and how Zach generates these, whether it should be a, um, a maybe not an offshoot of the planning board, but more of an offshoot, uh, its own independent uh, board that, that reports maybe to the Board of Selectmen uh, and or the, the planning board, because not everything really is planned. You mean like a, instead of a ZAC or have a ZAC, but also have a BAC, like a bylaw advisory yeah. committee? Something to that effect. Because mm -hmm. so, you know, some of the things that people come up, come up to ZAC with are out of the purview. It's like, well, no, that's not something that we can do at this time. Uh, this is, it's, it's, outside of the, it's outside of the four corners. Gotcha. And so, you know, whether or not it's a, it's a separate board, and well, the same thing with Zach, because also Zach has really don't has and have, doesn't operate with a charter. Also, it can be anywhere from five to as this year we had uh, 15 or 16 members at one time, and it was got to be quite difficult to manage as a chair. It's a lot of opinions at one time. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Any other ideas for the charter commission specific to the questionnaire? Nope. None for me. I mean, is the board interested in the budget calendar, uh, in changing the budget calendar at all, accelerating it? I know there was just some discussion uh, by other other committees and boards around trying to accelerate the budget calendar by as much as two months. In Meaning some cases. moving it up or, or starting it, it back earlier. and going faster? Starting it earlier. Starting earlier. Yeah. Uh, but, then, but then also having some of the deadlines be earlier as well. Uh, you know, another thing was around the control over the town warrant uh, in trying to uh, help ensure that the warrant doesn't get unwieldy. Um, uh, you know, there there are times when we open up we open up the warrant for a special town meeting. Is is the case where I think of in particular, where we'd like to have a special town meeting for one particular purpose. You know, maybe it's to vote on a school or something to that effect. But once we open the town warrant, uh, nobody has any control over what comes in and what's put on it. So any of the department heads, um, uh, voter petitions, you know, things like that can put any number of articles on the town warrant. And we have no control to say, no, <laughs> that's not the purpose of this special town meeting. Um, in years past, my understanding is there was control over that, and I believe it was with the charter. Uh, and, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because I might just be pulling this out of my, my behind. Uh, but my understanding is that it might have been with the charter where that was taken away, and there was discussion of putting that over with appropriations or uh, uh, some other group. I guess my, my personal thought is that if there was going to be some mechanism to control it, it should be something where it's members of various boards or committees, uh, you know, and maybe it's one or two members of the Board of Selectmen and appropriations and, you know, I don't know who else, you know, planning board, you know, school committee. I don't know what the makeup is, but have it be a combination rather than one committee or board having full control over it. My sense is specific to the warrant articles is however the structure gets massaged and, and sort of realigned a little bit and maybe tweaked. Um, but however that structure falls out in this process, then those department heads that fall under whatever that structure is and their authority upline has to be the approving of body to allow department heads to put an article on the warrant. In other words, any organization that reports into the town manager that reports to the Board of Selectmen has to come to the Board of Selectmen before they can put an article on the town warrant. I get a little agitated um, in the springtime when individuals that, quote, report to the board through various structures underneath us are going out and asking to buy all kinds of different things. I'm not, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but, you know, we have to be careful how we spend our money. And each department head looks at it from their perspective, and they make a great case for why they need it for their department. But when each one of them has the opportunity to throw the ballots or, or questions on the warrant, without coming to us who has to look at the whole picture, all of a sudden we've got a ballooned warrant and pretty soon a ballooned tax bill because, you know, 
the arguments are all made very well, um, but when you get into town meeting, you know, sometimes it can become a spending frenzy. So I'm just very concerned that structurally, when it comes to the warrant, that those departments that report to us and the other boards in town that are duly elected as well, that the approval process has to go through that elected body. That would change a lot in terms of how many articles and what kind of money we're spending. Okay. I, I mean, they do have to go to appropriations with it, and sometimes appropriations disapproval is kind of a kiss of death because it carries a lot of weight, but it doesn't absolutely it still preclude puts it, it on the from warrant, getting, yeah. it can still get passed. That's yeah. right. I remember yeah. Mr. Eldridge yeah. standing up a couple of times saying, we voted against this, and boom, it passed oh, unanimously. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Okay, anything else? Because we've got some other business to attend to. I think there's some good feedback here tonight, but we probably should do this another time or two, right? Yeah. Um, it, you know, I think we, we certainly can. Uh, I know that, and I'm going to look to Pam. Um, you know, I think that by the end of the summer, you know, we'd like to start having more broad public forums, and we'd like to get all the input from the various departments and committees first. Um, we, are are we still getting input and having meetings with other departments? We're yeah, we're done. So, so uh, so we're waiting on us. We're waiting on us. Okay. So <laughs> us just gave some information. Um, I think it would be a good idea, though, perhaps if Mr. Kamalo and his team could 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 organize these thoughts as well as others we've had in the past, Mr. Kamalo, and your experiences in the past into one document of input from the Board of Selectmen that we could review at a meeting, an upcoming meeting, and then present that to you? Does that make sense? That's fine. Does that work? Does that work for you, Mr. Kamal? Yes, it does. Um, okay. I, I think I, I can Jesus. collaborate with uh, Mr. Sestari. I'm sorry? I can work together with Mr. Sestari. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm trying to push the chair into meetings with more spacing between each other for the summer anyway, so. That chair. That chair. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all, I'm okay Sometimes with, I'm okay she, she, she drives hard. Sometimes it's, you know, okay, you know, this, I know this is our fourth meeting this month, but we're going to get through this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we did. Mrs. Wright. <laughs> just, I don't know if this is for the charter or for just this board, but um, I'd like to find a way that we can at least have the public feel that they have a little more information slash input into the budget process as it's developed. Um, I know this year there were some individuals at town meeting that wanted to kind of start picking the budget apart, which, you know, town meeting's not the place to do that. And maybe that'll always happen occasionally. Um, there was a question at the debates about specific parts of the budget. Um, the way it's put together, there are clearly major players that put the pieces together. Um, and I don't know how you do it efficiently, but if there would be a way that at a certain point, a certain draft could be presented for a public hearing just to get input and questions. So I, I've heard this repeatedly from, feeling, from people that they feel like they get to town meeting and there's this giant budget that's dumped on them and it's either A or nay. And um, just exploring a way that the public can feel some more engagement or input you into know, the budget I, process instead of just town meeting yes or no. I, I guess I'd like to make a comment on that. And, uh, you know, there, there is, a, a, as you'll see as we're going through it uh, in the coming eight months, ten months, um, there is a fairly well-defined calendar, mm -hmm. um, you know, with hard and fast dates that certain things need to happen. And, because, and, and that was created in the charter back in 2006. Right. Um, so right now, the town manager and, and our board and previous boards, um, we follow the calendar because we have to. Uh, we don't have discretion on that. And oftentimes, uh, the, the deadline for one step uh, is required to initiate the next step. And then it's such a tight time frame between the two that we'll have our meetings, and it may be that from when Mr. Kamalo is able to take the school department budget and his portion of the budget and bring them together, we might have a period of, I think, three weeks uh, to, to actually approve everything and hand it off to appropriations. And in that three weeks, we try to have, you know, at least two, if not three meetings where we can look at it mm -hmm. 
try to digest it, make some uh, you know quick and usually somewhat high level suggestions or requests for information, and then we come back and we look at it once more, make some fun, a little bit more refinements, and then and then. It's usually on the eve of, uh, you know, when the deadline is to hand it off to appropriations that we're saying, all right, <laughs> you know, this is, you know, we got to vote on it tonight oh, yeah, and we got to yeah. pass it off. Um, so, so the deadlines are, are really tight and certainly all of our meetings are open to the public to come in and to listen. As Mr. Herr mentioned earlier, uh, there's not always a time to comment, but you know we do try to open ourselves to comment. You know, for certainly for issues like that, uh, and, and but we need to contain them. So yeah. it's not always easy, and, and and something like this where we're addressing the charter and possible uh, augmentations to the budget calendar, uh, you know, that would be I think the, our only opportunity to to really broaden things much more. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not always the most imaginative person either when it comes to this stuff. So, okay, with that, if we could please, um, let's compile that um, list of ideas that we've discussed in the past, that you've seen in the past, we've discussed this evening, and perhaps some others, and we'll get that through uh, this board to uh, the Charter Review Committee. Okay. Okay. Everybody, go with that. Okay, if we could move on then, uh, we'll continue our public hearing now, which we opened at 8 p.m. to discuss and set the water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2017. Mr. Westerling and his uh, support team, as well as uh, folks from the Abrams Group, uh, are here to make a presentation. So we'll uh, keep the public hearing rolling now, or get it rolling by going to Mr. You want to go to Mr. Kamalo first, and then Mr. Kamalo can introduce our guests. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. By way of introduction, this the setting of water and sewer rates is before the selectmen because of the special act. The special act authorizes the board of selectmen to set the water and sewer rates. This is a process that happens annually. Also, in terms of process, uh, I believe this is one of the most labor-intensive uh, processes other than the budget that we go through as staff. Uh, it's a process that involves uh, the water and sewer departments, the director, the manager, uh, Eric Curry, uh, the finance team, uh, as well as our consultants, the Abrahams Group. Uh, I will tell you that this year, this process was much more smoother uh, because of a couple of things. One, um, the investment that the town has made in terms of improving our, our, our financial software capabilities. And then secondly, um, I think it's the years of training uh, going through this project uh, or this program over the years. I think has built some um, depth in terms of um, um, our institutional capacity. And then thirdly, it may not be obvious, but the link between this process and, and, the, and the budget that is already approved at town meeting is very important. Uh, I, I think what you'll hear from us uh, and from the consultants tonight is an attempt to make sure that that, that, that message is, is, is said loud and clear. And then finally, it's helpful for the board to look at this discussion in terms of assessing how the water and sewer enterprises perform as a business. Um, some of you may not have the background, but we did meet informally uh, with the new members of the board just to explain uh, some of the uh, capital, the long-term capital planning that has gone into uh, the, the sewer enterprise projects, as well as the work that we're currently undertaking with regard to, um, we, with regard to the water department. So the, the discussion tonight is based on the special act that establishes the Board of Selectmen as the authority for setting the water and sewer rates. That's done every year. And secondly, we also have a very strong interest in linking this discussion to the budget that is set uh, for the water and sewer enterprises. Granted, that budget is already in place. 
And then most importantly, we are always very interested in hearing the board's comments relative to how the water and sewer enterprises perform uh, as a business. By way of introduction, Eric Curry, uh, water and sewer manager, John Westerling, your director of public works, Mate Abrahams from the Abrahams Group is the consultant who's been helping us uh, putting together the workbooks that were shared with the board. Okay, just one other thing, if I could just add on to that for perhaps our new colleagues. Um, we're about to see a bunch of numbers and a bunch of different uh, assumptions and a few other factors. Uh, we could get really deep into the water here in the weeds very quickly. Uh, they're going to present basically two or three options at the end of all this, and those two or three options are going to roll up because of the math, and there's not going to be a whole lot that we can do sort of in between that. Um, so I'd encourage us to... It, 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 this is this is my ninth time I think going through this or eighth time about going about to go through this. It gets a little uh, heavy, but if you just kind of hang in there till the end, then the options become fairly clear, and then we make a decision. Uh, it's pretty straightforward when we get to that point. So I wouldn't deep breathe hyperventilate too quickly here with some of the stuff that they're about to share with us. I've already so. spent an hour or two with these guys going over something similar. Okay. So I. I a little bit brought up Good. to speed. Excellent. So, Excellent. so with that, please go right ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Matt Abrahams here from the Abrahams Group to show you the results of our water and sewer rate study. As Mr. Kamala mentioned earlier, this was a collaboration between many town departments as well as my father, Mark Abrahams, and myself. As we've done in recent years in the past, we analyzed each of the next five fiscal years looking outward, so that would include fiscal years 17 through fiscal years 21. Additionally, we also took a look at the current fiscal year and the impact that it would have on the Water Enterprise Fund and on the Sewer Enterprise Fund as well. And our work can be found in, two, in a few different files. Two of them are Excel workbooks. Um, some of which I believe that you have seen recently. Um, we also had a, a report that we produced that summarized everything at a little bit of a higher level. And we also have some slides to show you this evening. And we will walk through those now. We're going to start with water. In the top table, what we tried to do is two things here. We wanted to show you the projections for revenues in the top compared to the projections for expenditures and any difference between the two. So if there was an excess or a surplus, you would see a positive number in the third row down. If there is a deficiency or a deficit, you would see a negative number there. And we see a negative number for each of the fiscal years that we're looking at. In addition to that, the bottom part of the table is something that we call a retain earnings summary or retain earnings tracker, where we take the most recent uh, the retained earnings from the most recently completed fiscal year, which was FY15, and track it using the projections that we have all the way out through each of the years we're looking at. And part of the goal with the rate setting that we're looking at involves retained earnings and trying to possibly target a certain amount, but at least make sure that they're looking healthy in a given year. So the projections here, they look similar to those that we presented last year. If we look at the, the deficits in each of the years, FY17, we have a small deficit there, but the deficits get larger as we go outward towards FY21. Commitments are up each of the last three years. And in this analysis, we've also considered the additional properties that will be coming online or have come online recently. So that includes Legacy Farms and Muse. So we've accounted for both the, the, the consumption, the, the connections, because there, there is revenue associated with connections for, each of these, for some of these properties, and also user charges revenues as well. All the projections that you see here include all the capital items that are planned right now. So the way that we do that is we take a look at the capital plan, which extends out a few years, and we create borrowings schedules that would mimic what the town would do to take out borrowings for these for these items. 
and that all that information is accounted for in our numbers for water. Retained earnings at the end of FY15 is $24,000. You see that here, about $24,000. But there's a projected large surplus for FY16, which you see one line down, just under $1.3 million, mainly aided through large connection fee revenue that the town just recently realized for the Muse properties. Other water notes. The town is at capacity. Any new, con any new connections need to be provided from, from future unbuilt capacity. Plans for an additional $11.3 million water supply Standpipes, pipeline, and well field improvements to be paid primarily by new users. With these plans, which is the capital plan that we talked about earlier and the borrowings that we've projected, new debt service will peak in FY20 and FY21 and decrease from there. New users will provide additional connection fee and user charges revenues, and rate increases will be needed going forward. Quick summary, some more bill points for summary level. Sensitivity points, legacy farms and other developments build out materializes. We've assumed that in our analysis. 600 residential units to be added over the next five years. New water connections, except for legacy farms, all pay the water connection fee. Some decision points. The last two fiscal years, water rates were increased by 2%. We are recommending a rate increase for FY17 as part of a plan to ensure a positive retained earnings balance over the next five fiscal years. And that plan may need to be adjusted in future years. So we strongly recommend that it's looked at on a yearly basis. And here come the options. Option one, no action. The do nothing scenario. We we, if, the, if there are no changes in rates, we are projecting retained earnings at the end of FY17 to be about $1.1 million, which is a strong number, about 53% of the budget. However, due to the, the shortfalls, the deficits that we were looking at in one of the previous screens, retained earnings can only cover those up to a certain point. We're projecting that it would be depleted by 2019 without any further increases. And if there was, there was no action, we, show, we included the retained earnings balance projections for each for the fiscal years here. So 2020, a negative amount of just under $300,000. 2021, a much larger amount. Option two, 2% 2 rate increase. We focused on 2% because that was the, uh, the, the increase that was authorized each of the last two fiscal years. So we're show, we wanted to include uh, a little table to show the impact on users' bills, and those numbers represent per bill impact. So users in town receive two bills per year, but th those numbers re reflect just one of their bills. So even with a 2% increase in 17, we included that as part of a, we did some analysis if that were to be part of a five-year plan at 2% in each of the years and retained earnings still projects at a large negative number under that plan. Option three, we focus on 4.75%. It's the same setup as the previous slide, so you, would, you can see the bill impact, per bill impact for some different user types. And a little bit of a different scenario as we look outward now, the numbers at the bottom represent the 4.75 increase in each of the fiscal years. However, we're projecting a positive retained earnings balance at the end of FY21 under that scenario of about $33,000, or 1% of the budget. So that's not a large balance for retained earnings, but it is a positive one. Sewer. Can we, yeah, can we talk about water for 
first. Sure. Let's do water first, and then we'll sure. see what that's okay, you guys. Um, so we're in a public hearing. Um, so they presented water. We can talk water. The last thing we put on water from the public. We can bring it a lot. Taste like the theater. Um, and then we'll go to sewer. So we'll just go ahead and get the water. Um, could you bring up the chart, the, the spreadsheet on water, please? This one? Uh, yeah. You mentioned that the numbers are very similar to what you projected and showed us last year. Can you tell me which ones are similar? Because I'm looking at what you showed us last year, and they look very different. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I'll just I'll give you an example. So, last year when we were doing this, we showed in the top level that the uh, total revenues, uh, requested total revenues and other financial sources were going to be about 2.6 million. Total expenditures 1.9 million, and we we're projecting. Uh, well, we had the an excess of 662,000. Which fiscal year are you looking at? 2016. As we look at projected for 2017, it was total revenues of 2.8 million, expenditures of 2.1 million, with an excess of 645,000. And that's in the positive. And that seems very different from, from what we're looking at in this chart. Yes, I can speak to some of that. Last year's projections, we were a little, um, we, projected the connection fee revenues with the information that we had available to us at the time. Mm -hmm. And we thought that the Muse connections would be spread out over multiple years, whereas this year we learned that that was not the case, and the town actually collected all that revenue in FY16. Okay. Through, through the chair, just so you'll, you'll notice that the projected FY16 surplus, the 1.293, that's primarily $1.2 million from the Muse they paid. All of their connection fees, mm -hmm. 180 times four thousand dollars, they paid it all at once. Okay. Whereas Matt described, we had projected that those would be spread out over a number of years. All right. Um, so, I guess if if we had known what we know now, then, um, and and this is rhetorical, clearly, but you know, would we would we have had reason, or would we have made a different decision last year? I'm just and, and I mean, would we have had reason to? I'm just asking. I, I'm not sure if it. Through the chair, I think that in general, what we see here is that we've got capital expenditures which are uh, raising the the amount of our debt, so we've got to cover that over the next several years. So I think that there would have been an increase recommended anyways. Mm -hmm. If it would have been two percent, I can't say. Mm -hmm. That's where we delve into the numbers a little more closely. It may have been. <coughs> from the 2%, but I think that a rate increase would have been required anyway when we look at the five-year plan. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. This is right. Mm, not right now. Mr. Catino. I'm going to be the broken record because we be the third time I asked the same one. The um, water loss due to old meters, and I know that we've always been trying to get that 10% goal. What did we hit last year? Now, not counting new connections, one, old ones that went out. What, how much? What percentage did we hit? Through the chair, if I can answer that, uh, through what we did for uh, meter replacements, we were overwhelmed, and, and we we set up an annual budget for meter replacements. We were overwhelmed with the number of meter replacements. Excuse me, the number of new meter requests through Legacy Farms. So that took up a lot of our budget. Uh, those areas that we did focus on for meter replacements, we looked at the higher users, uh, the, the condos up off of uh, School Street. Um, any other big ones, Eric, that we hit upon? If I yeah, absolutely. Do we to that? What we did is we, the time that we did have, we weren't spending, you know, in my 30 years here, the amount of construction that's taken place in this last couple of years is just unbelievable. It's really taken up an amount of our resources. So what we did do is target uh, those meters that were uh, older and the two inch meters that are not really designed that were put in there way back in the 80s and 90s that really could, if you have a, an eight or 10 unit condo, you flush a toilet, 
it's barely even going to move. So we targeted those. That was going to give us our biggest bang for the buck, and we were able to place uh, almost all of those you know, in a uh, short time frame. It's going to make a significant difference in helping out towards this. Along with still going towards the goal of trying to get all of the other ones, but we were able to really target that. Uh, you know, that's replacing those centimeters is really quadruple doing a single residential year in terms of your bang for your buck. Right, but 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 my my point is so now that so if we didn't hit the ten percent last year and we didn't hit it the year before. So now we're, in order to catch up for this year, we have to do 25, 26% or something like that. You know, and, and that's lost revenue that, that we'd be able to be putting up here from lost, lost water. So you know, has anybody looked into bringing in an outside contractor to pay them to do these changes for us so we don't fall behind? Because we're collecting $4,000 for every new hookup we're doing. And um, so, you know, whether we pay a new contractor or somebody to do the new ones, or, or we get somebody, get bringing people to do the, to make sure we get our 10% or now 20% or 25%, whatever it might be, to catch up. Because if we keep falling behind every single year, hey, that's, you know, half the distance to the goal. You know, we're we just getting that, that same uh, football analogy. Um, you know, and we're not getting, getting, the, getting up to the revenues that we should be getting. You know, if you're talking about meters that were put in in the 80s, you know, it, it's, you know, that's, it's, you know, so if, you know, if somebody could just look into the, you know, that cost, you know, I'm sure that we could recoup it quickly and then it's, you know, then you just get rid of them as soon as we get, get to the goal of replacing them all. Because, you know, this is, the, I, I brought up two years ago, last year, and I do it because it's big numbers. Just for reference, we do test and significant amount of the ones that we do pull out and test that are aged are really not as off as one might think, which is, you know, we still obviously want to do that, but it's not a dramatic, you know, 30, 40% difference. Uh, most of them are pretty close to accurate even after 10, 15 years, which is, which is you know, obviously we want to bring them all to the new system so that it also, you know, helps work through the whole munis process as well. Well, 10 or 15 years would be would have been a, uh, a 2005 or a 2001, not, not, not one from the 80s. Too, the good news is the new ones that we're putting in are all, uh, there's no mechanical parts in them, and that's one of the issues with the old meters, they have mechanical parts, and of course all that wear and tear, and the new ones are all a magnetic flow, so they're 25 to 25 year life expectancy before they even start to look. And my last question is, which I probably should have started with, is what is our, what is our loss right now? So, so your, your, your first question leads through the chair. Your first question leads to the second question, which is non-revenue water. And that's uh, meters that are reading less than they should be. That is leaks. That is uh, water that isn't metered through illicit connections or what have you. And we've got the good news story is that we've brought that from the low 20s. Last year it was down to uh, just over well, we're at 29. So four years ago, it, we've brought it from the, the 20s down to last year was 17. 17, and this, the year before that was, uh, was right around 18 or 19. Yeah, so we, we've, we've continued to decrease that non-revenue water. We were at 17 last calendar year, and we just found uh, three major leaks, which account for about 2%. So we're hitting that goal of 15%. We may not be able to reach that by 10% meter replacement every year, but the non-revenue water, we are driving that down through <coughs> other leak detection and through uh, the transfer to the munis billing system was big because it helped to reconcile a lot of accounts. Uh, how about how about volume-wise uh, the decrease? Because as obviously as we're hooking up more meters, that means we're bringing our top line up. So if we keep the leaks the same and raise the top line, then our percentage leaks are going down. Um, so are we are we changing the volume? Of, of non revenue water? Excellent question. Which I'm not <laughs> it wasn't really, <laughs> that was a really good question. Wow. It's, it's the math stomach. major in me. <laughs> Does that change what we have you to can do come back with tonight? An, you can come back with an answer. You know, it's, yeah. yeah, and we're, we're happy to provide, through the chair, we're happy to provide the board with a summary of what we have replaced for meters and what we've installed for meters. Uh, it doesn't change where we are this evening. It doesn't change the yeah. fact of 
revenues versus expenditures. This is my only time to ask, though. No, I understand, and it's an excellent question, and it's all non-revenue water. Why would we want to increase rates if we can't control the non-revenue water? And we're bringing it to very close to the goal of the DEP establishes. Okay. Mr. Tedstone. Uh, <clears throat> I brought this up when we went over this before, and it's just kind of lingered in my head. The $4,000 connection fee that we have, um, I built, uh, I had a small subdivision that I built myself uh, about 10 years ago. I spent $4,000 to connect there. Why don't, with all the construction going on, is there a reason why we don't look at this and say, why isn't it $8,000? Because I don't know any developer, if they're going to build an $800,000 house, $600,000 house, they're going to balk at doubling. They're not going to not build a house in town and instead of charging $799, charge $803, uh, add an additional $4,000 to the connection and uh, have that go into this. I don't know. Um, I'd like to know why we were stuck on the $4,000 and if it's because we're looking at our, the, the surrounding towns around us that are doing it $4,000, why aren't we looking at Wellesley, Weston, Dover, Sherburn? I think, I think from a legal standpoint, you have to have the cost justification and you can't make a profit on it. It's, um, you know, what, what's it costing us? And, 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 you know, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, well, I find it hard to believe that it, 10 years later that it, it was $4,000 back then and it's $4,000. I think it was back then they were ripping you off. <laughs> I have no problem taking a rebate on that, <laughs> getting a reimbursement. Through, through yeah, in fact, we can – go ahead. Now, through the chair, we had the Abrahams Group. They did uh, a review of our water entry fees. Mm -hmm. and they followed the American Water Works Association guidelines, and that looks at a lot of things. It looks at the cost for the department. It looks at the cost of future water supply. It looks at the cost of capital improvements. And long story short, we came down to the fact that the $4,000 is about appropriate for what, what we're looking at. And happy to share that with the new members of the board, the findings, and that was reviewed with the Board of Selectmen last year about this time. Yeah. Okay, so water. Everybody good on water? We've got a lot more to cover here. Mrs. Wright. Can I just ask one clarification, uh, Mr. Abrams? Under water notes, it says the town, number one, the town is at capacity. New connections for approved and planned project lists will need to be provided from future unbuilt capacity. I'm not sure what project lists are. Are you talking about approved and planned projects that the planning board has approved where mm. They have been told, the applicant has been told that they can have water and sewer, or I'm not sure what project lists are. Uh, through the chair, um, that's an excellent question. We do have 1.21 million gallons per day is what we can pump from our sources according to our Water Management Act permit. And that covers basically the developments that we have ongoing today. Future projects will exceed that 1.21 million gallons per day. And that's what we've asked for in our next Water Management Act permit, which we have already applied for. It shows that 1.21 million gallons increasing to 1.4. Um, so as, as that increases and as we're challenged to supply that water, especially in the summertime when those peak demands are, are hit, that's why an interconnection for Ashland to the MWRA was so important for us so that we can meet that demand. So then through you, Mr. Chair, um, am I understanding correctly that there are projects that were approved by the planning board the applicant was told they could have water in sewer and now this is saying that there actually is not the water and sewer capacity to provide them until there is well this says it'll have to be provided from future unbuilt capacity so have we made promises that now we don't have the supply for Chair, I wouldn't say that we've made promises, but if you look at the Muse agreement right. that they signed with the town, they have to provide $25,000 to the town to help us permit and find new water supplies. So everyone has been understanding the fact that we're close. We've written that into our permit agreements um, or our approvals for, for subdivisions. So we're at maximum capacity, especially during summertime. So just to clarify, if every single thing that's been permitted was built today, there wouldn't be enough water supplied. I think that would put us right at that 1.2 million gallons permitted, but then it becomes a problem for 
Mr. Cardi and his team to be able to pump that out of the ground, right. especially during drought periods. So we believe that we're, we're, our permitted withdrawal, 1.21 million gallons per day, can satisfy those projects on a permitted level. It's a matter of getting it out of the ground. It's a matter of Ashland being able to supply it to us when the demand is high. But the supply in Ashland, they also suffer the same problems with their aquifers going down as there are droughts. And they can't supply to us even the minimum amount of 300,000 gallons per day. They, they bring theirs down to two years ago, it was 130,000 gallons per day. So that's why we're, we're permitted, but it's a problem of trying to meet that permit level, especially during drought periods. Okay, so, sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. But Mr. Westerling was mentioning uh, the agreement with Ashland, and now we are revising that agreement with Ashland based on our recent town meeting vote. And does that, does that change the landscape for us at all? Through the chair, that would dramatically improve the landscape. Because what will occur is Ashland will have an interconnection with the MWRA. When we go to Ashland and we say, this is our peak period, we've got all these projects, we need to pump more water, we can't meet that. Please, Ashland, you get your water supply from MWRA and give us the water supply coming out of your aquifer. Mm -hmm. That allows that to happen. Then they can supply up to the million gallons per day. We wouldn't need that on, on our peak days, but they're able to then provide what we would need. So if Eric can't pump it out of the ground, we just open the spigot to Ashland. And what's the, what's the timeline to all of that being a reality? We're still in the design phase. Um, Ash Ballpark, Ash two years, three years? So it was a long process. Mm -hmm. Several years. Yeah. Chair, I, I think that if, if Ashland votes it and they start charging ahead, I think that we're looking at two years' time. Okay. Thank you. Bless you. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Uh, water. So we've got some great information from the DPW folks and their consultant. Um, we've got three options in front of us on water. Uh, I personally am inclined to go 2%. The impact to the average rate payer is minimal, very minimal, but it's, I don't like the idea of just, uh, in the past I've always said no, <laughs> right, John? I've said no rate increase, uh, no. But at 2% in the numbers we're talking about here in terms of an increase to the average rate payer, I think it's manageable for everybody and it doesn't put us in the, it does not put us in the hole going forward. If we stayed at current numbers, we would find ourselves in a hole here in a couple of years. So I'm thinking 2%, 4.75, I think it's, Nice to have, but I don't think we need it. Um, so that's my thought, just to get this going. Yep. If that's, does anyone else have any other thoughts or want to do something different? I think 2% is very manageable. When I think about people with fixed incomes in town, um, I think that the average, I think when we talked about it, the average was about $5 a year. And uh, I think a lot of the, like the elderly and, and uh, people like that, they'll use less than, than that. And I'm fine with that. Okay. Everybody else okay? So we won't vote this now, I just wanted to kind of, so we can wrap up water. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, unless someone wants to say something else. Let's actually though, because we're in a public hearing, let's see if there's any in public input on water, specific to water. Seeing none, we'll move ahead. Okay, let's talk sewer now, please. Sewer. Similar slide to what you saw when we kicked off the water discussion. One big difference being the retained earnings balance, the last certified amount of just over $2 million. So retained earnings wise, much different scenario than water. However, if we focus on, I think we just lost that. If we focus on the deficit line, the third line down, the deficits are a little bit larger going outward in each of the fiscal years that we're that we're looking at. That's a little bit of a different story with water. So in the do nothing scenario, as you'll see, when we get there, retained earnings gets depleted a year earlier than we were showing for water, FY18. Projections similar to those presented last year, submitted FY17 budget includes $558,000 in retained earnings to balance the budget. See the large shortfalls in each of the five fiscal years. 
commitments are up from last year after a slight decline the prior year. Debt service peaks in FY16 and steadily declines. That's debt service that is currently on the books. Projections do not include future capital needs. So this is a, a difference when we look at when we compare to water. Water, we were able to analyze a full capital plan over the next few years and include projections associated with borrowings related to that plan. Whereas with sewer, there is no there is not a similar plan in place, not yet. Uh, it's being worked on as we speak. So therefore, the projections that we show you tonight do not include capital, large capital expendi expenditures looking outward a few years. And there may be a capital plan in place in the near future that will strongly recommend large capital purchases. So please keep that in mind as we go forward. Great, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, back up what Matt is saying and provide a little more information, recall the town meeting appropriated $140,000 to do a sewer capacity analysis and a business plan that will look at where we can expand sewers, how much sewer we can provide, and a business plan to make it financially stable. Okay. Thank you, John. As already mentioned, retained earnings can carry the sewer fund, but only through FY18, even that large amount. Other notes. The town is at capacity for sewer. Additional water system growth will result in additional sewer flow to be treated. The last CWMP was completed in 2004 and is being updated, as we just mentioned. The sewer fund has a shortfall that will need to be addressed. Sensitivity points, or point. Additional sewer capacity is needed, but only at a reasonable price. Sewer decision points. Last year, sewer rates were increased by 3.75% as part of a multi-year plan to balance the sewer fund. And we reviewed the rates just prior, and we believe that sewer rates increased 2% in the prior fiscal year, in FY, going into FY15. Just like with water, a rate increase is recommended for FY17 as part of a plan to balance the sewer fund over the next five years, and it made need to be adjusted in future years. Just like with water, we strongly recommend monitoring the sewer fund <coughs> and its finances on an annual basis and whether rate increases are necessary. So just like with water, we're presenting three options. The first option, just like water, is the do nothing or no action scenario. With no changes in rates, we're projecting retained earnings at the end of FY17 to be just under a million dollars, or about 30% of the budget. As already mentioned, retained earnings can, ca can cover projected shortfalls, excuse me, through FY18, but not beyond that. And we show, we provided some projected retained earnings negative balances for the three fiscal years after that. Option two representing a 3.75% rate increase and the impact on the same user base that we were looking at for water. We're, provide, we, we're presenting the 3.75% increase because that's the one that was selected last year as part of a multi-year plan. And if the 3.75% increase were to take place in each of the five, each of the next five fiscal years, you're looking at a small retained earnings projected negative balance. And option three, 4.75 would be the rate increase. The impact on the same user base is presented in the table. And the projections, if 4.75% were to be authorized in each of the next five years, we're looking at a retained earnings balance of about $129,000, or 5% of the budget, and the fund would be fully balanced by FY21. And that concludes our presentation on sewer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's start with Mr. Catino. Uh, well, my question's coming back down. If you go back to the, um, this, the other, um, other points, uh, sewer, other sewer notes. 
I could have sworn last year we were told that um, we were going to update the CWMP, and now it's uh, that we were we were just got negotiations on that. And that's has it not been updated? So through the chair, that's that's the hundred and forty thousand dollars that I mentioned. The town meeting appropriated. The engineers are currently looking at an analysis of all the connected properties. They're looking at the entire sewer infrastructure, the pipe sizes, the slopes, finding where the shortfalls are, where the limitations are, which will then tell us where development can or cannot occur, what upgrades are necessary. So it's ongoing work. We're looking for a report this year. Excellent. Because uh, you know, because right now we're we're telling the rest of the world that we don't have water and we don't have sewer. And so, you know, that's really not a very good thing to be telling, uh, telling the world. It's, uh, so we're, we're saying that, uh, that we're a vibrant, welcoming community to, to businesses and, and development and whatnot. But now we're saying, but uh, there's no water, no sewer. So we've got to um, really look ahead and make sure that uh, we do have capacity in order to... Uh, um, be marketable in the through the chair your, your your point is well well taken and it's well made uh, we're at capacity for water when we look at our maximum permitted amount that's why we're requesting through the state an increase in that amount uh, we are at sewer capacity for major projects witness the development of the muse they had to put in their own sewage treatment facility because we just couldn't take on another 280 units uh, when they were looking at developing the Parkwood property, we had to tell them we can't we can't take on an additional millions of gallons. Uh, so for for the large projects, yes, we are, and that's why we work with developers to find other on-site options. There are other options that we do have, such as building out the Fruit Street treatment facility uh, that's currently only built for 100,000 gallons per day. It can be expanded to 350,000 gallons per day. And that's an opportunity where if a developer comes in, we can work with them to build that capacity with the developer's help in expending that cost. So although we are reaching our maximums, we do have some capacity in there, but we also have options for expanding that capacity. Mr. Tedstone. I'm good. All set. Mrs. Wright. So my same question on the sewer, when you say we're at capacity for sewer, um, included in that capacity are already permitted projects through the chair that's correct and remember legacy farms they built their own treatment facility the muse has built their own right. treatment facility um what other ones uh, are on sewer that are currently adding uh septic systems for the, the north pond uh, yeah so Davenport. but 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 my question is anything that has been permitted uh, any plans that have been approved by the planning board that are not yet built if they were promised sewer within that at capacity they are included in that and that's through the chair that's what was goes into that statement of we're at capacity because we know yep. who's building sewers what the flow will be oh. uh, there's, there's there is a small amount of room in there but we're, for all intents and purposes we're at capacity we can't take on a muse we can't take on a parkwood drive no. without expanding our capacity there's room to expand there are plans to expand but that has to be borne at the cost by, by potential developers coming forward. All set? Yep. Mr. Sister. Yeah, I guess, you know, just to comment on, on the growth component, I'm going to summon my, uh, my inner uh, Mr. Mosier. And one of the things that he always harped on was the planning component of this. And, you know, we often, we often look at different components of growth and try to assign uh, you know fees and costs and things of that nature and you know we look and we say okay a water connection is four thousand dollars and sewer is this um, but then there's always that there's always that one that tips the scale and causes us to have to expand the wastewater treatment facility or find a new well or a new water source somewhere else and things of that nature. Now all of a sudden that connection isn't costing us four thousand dollars, it's costing us a couple million dollars. Um, and sure it expands our ability to, for, for further growth, but then there's also the question of do you want to keep growing? So you know when I look at this stuff, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that we're coming up on 
on our current limitations and our current capacities. Um, I can appreciate Mr. Catino's comments about it's difficult to really uh, consider the town as marketable for expansion. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, you could say, well, we need to address it so that we can maintain marketability. On the other hand, you can say, well, we need to keep an eye on this and make sure that we're not approving projects that go beyond our current capacity because we don't want to spend millions more dollars to, uh, to expand our infrastructure. So it's just some food for thought, I guess, for our board, for the planning board, and, you know, any other boards and committees that are involved in these different pr processes. So. Okay. Um, anyone from the public? So we all good as far as our thoughts on sewer. Anyone from the public want to comment on the sewer piece of the puzzle here? Okay. So seeing none, um, just one quick comment on sewer uh, from my perspective anyway. We've got a lot going on in town with the schools and the DPW facility and the library and, and, and several other private you know, ventures. An awful lot of construction is coming our way and will continue for several years. Uh, we're going to talk about trash uh, and recycling program here in a few minutes. If there's a topic <laughs> that will get the passions of Hopkinton stirred even further than some of the ones that we have in front of us now, it is sewer and expanding sewer capacity in town. Uh, the Fruit Street expansion up to 300,000 gallons per minute. While it sounds like you know we've got a place that's ready for it and we can do it like that, it is years in the making and it is a significant lift um, in terms of the local politics in town, if you will, uh, as well as the uh, approvals at the state, local and state level. So uh, sewer is going to be a challenge for us going forward. All the new projects are doing their own thing. Uh, to your point, you know, it's hard to welcome people to town uh, when we don't have it, but people are coming to town and providing their own. So it can still, we can work around it. There's a workaround. Yes, it's a little bit more expensive. But uh, I think that's a lot easier, frankly, than trying to go to Fruit Street and go up to another 200,000 gallons per day or build another plant somewhere. Welcome I mean, to that's town. Just, Please don't flush. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that's just, I think it's a big lift right now in the community with everything else that we have going on. So I, as one, would not be inclined to want to go down that path <coughs> or anytime soon. Um, but I'm just one. So uh, that said, though, specific to the question in front of us, uh, no public input on sewer. We've got our input on water. We've, got our, we've had our dialogue with the, with the uh, team here. I would suggest that we uh, provide a motion to close the public hearing uh, for the water and sewer rates discussion for FY17. So moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second on the table to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we'll go ahead. Uh, the public hearing portion... Uh, of this discussion is now closed and the board can deliberate the two questions in front of us which is the water and sewer water rate for FY17 as well as the sewer rate for FY17. I think we had a consensus earlier about a 2% increase for water so if someone's inclined to make a motion. I, I, I'd actually like to ask another question on water. If okay. I could. Can we do the, mo you want to do the motion that's first? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Or do you want to do the questions because it might impact your mo the motion? I'm not going to make the motion, so. Okay. This is right. I, I do have a comment on that. Both of these, I understand we don't want to spend more money and the taxpayers don't want any more costs. And I also understand that in the next year or so, we're going to have a pr tremendously big hit for all the spending that was approved. So, you know, the next year or two is going to be, we're going to really feel it. So I understand wanting to keep everything down. But looking at this as a business, um, you know, we've got two enterprises where the expenses are exceeding the income. And, you know, I, I'm really not comfortable with kicking the can down the road. Um, you look at what the, what the numbers are of, of delaying this. Um, I don't know whether it's fiscally responsible from a long-term financial planning for the town to keep avoiding paying a piper that we're not bringing in the right amount of money to cover our costs. Um, whether we should look at a slightly larger increase. I mean, it's, it's more palatable to everybody to say oh, we don't want to spend as much, but 
down the road it doesn't seem to be particularly responsible. This okay, I'm not clear which this, this often yeah, this often, Ms. Wright, um, it ends up kinda like uh, steering a boat. <laughs> you know, you start you start turning the wheel and then, you know, you see, okay, well, we've overcompensated a little bit in this direction, now we need to compensate in the other direction. And so it's a little bit, you know, you, you try to find that rum line and you try to stick to it. But, you know, you can see from the water, uh, we're, you know, right now, uh, we're not currently at a deficit on, on the water side. Um, but we've got projects coming up over the next couple of years. And this is actually going to be my question. And, and forgive me if you've already answered it in, in the presentation. But, you know, we're currently at a $1.1 million surplus. And if we don't raise rates, then in five years, we're going to be at $971,000 deficit. Um, and I'm just, again, forgive me if, if you already answered this question, but there's a $2 million gap there. Um, what's, what's happening for $2 million? Is this the water tower replacement? Is it other projects? Is it, you know, what, what's going on there that's going to soak that up? Chair, uh, if you look at the million dollars that we have now, that was a windfall basically from the mirrors and them paying their fees. So that brought okay. us up. Uh, what will bring down our retained earnings are all the capital projects which we've approved. Uh, previously approved and just recently approved, which is also previous but more short, short term. Um, if you look at the water tower, if you look at the million dollars for the Ashland source of supply, this also projects out capital expenditures moving forward. So there is a million dollars for pipe improvements to improve the water flow from Ashland. Uh, we, we're, we're looking at uh, reducing iron and manganese through a bio, bio filter over at wells four and five, the Whitehall wells. So that will come with a component for treatment of that water. Uh, so it's, it's all of those capital projects and equipment moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to take away from your question. I was trying to answer it. If anybody else has any comments to that, I, I apologize. Okay, so back to the question at hand. We have a, uh, a presentation and three options for the water rate for FY17. Does anybody want to make a motion specific to what they'd like to see happen with the rate for FY17? I'd make a motion to raise the rates. 2% for water for water for FY17 okay I think the motions in order is there a second awesome my first motion <laughs> not second I'll second okay so we have a motion and a second on the table discussion on a 2% increase for water I just think we're going to have to realize that we can do 2% now, but eventually it, it's we're going to have to pay the piper um, you know there has not been a three point a 3.0 or a 3.75 option listed something maybe in the middle, but um, you know I'm I'm off for keeping it low, but we can only we can only delay it for so long. We'll have to bite the bullet a little harder if we don't increase it now. So. I think if we stayed flat and didn't increase at all, that would be kicking it down the road yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But at two percent, we're we're taking a step to be healthy going forward, but we're not going all the way. Uh, Dollar-wise, we're, we're splitting hairs here as pennies, you know, to the average rate payer over the course of a year. But I think there's a message in it, too, that, you know, we don't want to take more than we really need in a fiscal year. I mean, that's sort of one of my fundamentals that I try to work under. So that's why I support the 2% as opposed to a little bit higher number. Any other thoughts? Well, I, I originally, the reason why I held up on, on the second was um, because of the, because of the, Small amounts, and as as uh, uh, Sullivan Wright was just talking about that, um, we, it, it's as much as it's doing nothing is kicking the can down the road, but by you know putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, that maybe uh, you know looking at even though it was two three seven five and what four with three seven, for water. Um, 4.75 is the next one? Yeah. Yes. Two yes. and 4.75, I believe. Right. So so one completely pays it off. And to, to, to um, Mr. Sestari's uh, comment, you know, you don't want to overcompensate and, 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 and really hit people in one year because it's only 475, 475, 475. 
but um, you know what will make us more solvent, and, and what's you know what's the difference between solvent and, and prudent and. Well, yeah, and, and I guess I'd also look at, uh, you know, the, where where your eye gets drawn to is okay. Where are we now? And if we use X percent, whether it's zero, two, five, whatever, you know, where are we going to be in five years? Well, that five-year projection is what's been given to us. You know, they could have just as easily given us a seven-year projection or a ten-year projection, and then we'd be looking at that and saying, oh, okay, well, we should be trying to get that to zero or maybe a little bit on the positive side in seven years or ten years. This is something that we adjust every year. So if we start seeing ourselves going off course, uh, you know, then, then we can make another micro adjustment or a major, you know, hopefully not a major adjustment, uh, but we can make further adjustments as we're getting closer. Uh, the other comment I would have is that, you know, again, these are five-year projections. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily reality, uh, and, and we won't know what reality is until it's, you know, yesterday. <laughs> So uh, you know, we just keep we just keep trying to keep it steady. I, in in my opinion, uh, without shocking the ratepayers too much. Okay. One, is there any way to deflect some of the costs that we're absorbing here, the, the debt that we're absorbing, onto the contractors, making it so they're the onus is like I, I know that I brought up that four thousand dollar connection fee, and I guess we're tied, you know, by the state, but it. Are there more fees? Something that we can put, like, like it, it doesn't bother me if I if I see a developer not drive through in a Range Rover, they have to drive an expedition. Uh, Most you know of the I'm projects saying? in town have some form of mitigation that comes with the approval process that would require that they, it's not the 4,000, it would require, you know, for example, streets, $400,000 worth of road repairs, or if they need sewer, they've got to build their own plant, or if they want water from the town, they've got to help us upgrade some motors and certain yep. pump stations. So those types of negotiations do take place okay. as part of the approval process when it goes through planning um, and other uh, entities in town. Also through the chair, witness what we did with the MUSE approval. We received not only the $1.2 million in the fees, but also $25,000 towards finding new sources of water, right. and we just worked with the planning board. It used to be Mr. Cardi's water and sewer forces that would go out and have to inspect the utilities, which took them away from other work like replacing meters. But that is now going to be handled by the planning board's inspectional services okay. through their engineer. So we are making inroads towards relieving staff, taking some of the burden off of the town, and looking for financial resources to help us find these new sources of supply. Great. Okay, so we have a motion on the table and a second for a 2% water increase for FY17. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous and so carries a 2%. The wa um, that's for the water rate. Next up, sewer rate. Uh, Mr. Abrams, if you could be so kind and put the sewer rate options, there was... Um, nothing, 3.75 and 4.75, okay? Um, so again, similar kind of scenario, uh, and I think similar discussion. I don't think doing nothing is prudent. To Mrs. Wright's point a few minutes ago, we've got to be thinking down the road a little bit. 4.75% rate increase on a more expensive bill for the rate payer I think is a bit much. So I'm inclined to look at that 3.75 from my seat anyway. Fine as well. Through the chair, may I provide a little perspective on what we're looking at on the sewer side? Didn't we already do that? <laughs> well, it's worth, uh, we did. So I will. <laughs> no, if you've got something new and exciting to pre report, well, I, I please do. do. <laughs> It goes back to what Selectman Coutinho had mentioned about capacity. Yeah. Part of the problem here and the reasons that the deficits are so much greater in the sewer side than the water side is the fact that we've built capacity, we've built infrastructure, and we've got somewhere in some of the sections <coughs> only 50% of the people connected. So building capacity is expensive. So to build it, to have it, to attract developers is expensive. We've, we've done that in the past. We built the Fruit Street facility, which was $10 million. Some of our phases only have 50% of the folks connected. So that's, that should, I wanted to shed a little more perspective on 
why we're looking at the deficits moving forward and why the increases are, are greater than water to a magnitude of double. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Westerling, is there a fee associated with, I know that there's betterments, but is there also, like we have the connection fee for water, is there a connection fee for sewer that comes to us, or is it strictly through the betterment? Through the chair, there is, and that amount is? It's just a permit fee. Okay. Dollar. Okay. The betterment is basically the yep. Fee. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion on the sewer rate? I will make a motion to raise the sewer rate 3.75 percent. I'll second you. For FY17. Okay. So we have a motion and a second for FY17 3.75 percent for sewer. Any discussion? And so just to clarify it for the people that are watching at home, it's like if you're the average user in town, it's $25, 30, 25 to $26 a year. So it's, I've, it's, it's a good way to chip away some of the, some of the, uh, the red, but uh, it's not going to, hopefully not going to break the bank for everybody. Okay. Anyone else? All those fit in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so it's unanimous and so carries. Uh, sewer rate will increase 3.75% for FY17. Mr. Kamala. Again, I want to thank the board for another very thoughtful discussion. I think there are some interesting uh, points that we as staff need to follow upon. Um, uh, we, we heard your comments. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the, uh, the teams that worked on this project. Uh, the finance team did some heavy lifting. Abraham's group, great job. Uh, John, Eric, and your teams, this would not have been possible without your fantastic effort. Completely agree. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Westerling is going to continue to stay with us for a few minutes here. Um, <laughs> next up on our agenda, and other than a couple of administrative things, last up on our agenda this evening, uh, we have... Uh, a solid waste and recycling contract renewal discussion scheduled. Um, so we talked, so in the past, the Board of Selectmen with different members have talked about the situation with E.L. Harvey and Sons. Mr. Kamal, do you have something? Yes, I will shortly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So in the past, we've talked with... Um, uh, as a board about the trash and recycling program and the contract that was in place with the L. Harvey and Sons and how that is up for renewal on or expires on June 30th and we need to be ready for a new contract on July 1 on or about um, and at that time the board uh, encouraged Mr. Kamala to continue down a path to try and find some options that the board could consider uh, with E.L. Harvey uh, in their various programs um, we've since had an election and we added two new members to our board and um, the discussion is continuing about the trash services and recycling services in town uh, we talked about it briefly I think in our first or second meeting uh, since we reconstituted the board and then uh, there was a little bit of confusion about some other stuff that was going on in town specific to this that uh, public forum that Mr. Westerling attended uh, as our professional staff person leading this effort uh, was held at HCAM last week on I believe uh, I don't recall it was on Tuesday evening it was um, and there he worked with the HCAM news team to report out to the community those that were watching um, you know, what he's considering and what he's putting forward to the town manager and for the selectmen to consider about the trash and recycling program. Uh, I went from our meeting over to that and sat and uh, watched and listened and learned a great deal about where we are and also went to the microphone and asked a couple of questions and made a couple of points. The major point I wanted to make was that that evening, last Tuesday evening, was not the public hearing for the trash and recycling discussion. That was not the only time we were going to talk about trash and recycling before we take any vote and that uh, people would have an opportunity to come before us uh, in the form of a public hearing of sorts 
to make uh, their voices heard. We've got a lot of emails since then, since that program. I think it did its job and then it stirred some thought and idea in town. And uh, here we are now this evening. The, the central question I think before us tonight is, um, and I appreciate you bringing in all the props for, uh, to really drive home the, what we're talking about here. I think the central question before us tonight is how are we going to proceed going forward, not what we're going to decide going forward just yet. So we want to have a public hearing. I think everyone agrees that we need to have an opportunity for the Board of Selectmen, the Town Manager, and our DPW Director to hear from the public directly. So we have to schedule that. It's not required by law that we have a public hearing for this, but we can do it uh, in that format so that we give people a chance to really come in and voice their concerns um, openly. So I think that's the first thing we have to discuss is what is the next step to make that happen, Mr. Kamal? The next step then will be for the board to schedule this issue for discussion at its next meeting, which is June 21st, June 21. June 21, okay. Um, the contract expires June 30th. That is correct. Is there any wiggle room past that date with the contract that's in place today? If the board so de desires, we as staff can work on that issue. Okay, so I know we have two members I believe I know we have two members that may not be available on June 21st. Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So are you inclined to weigh in on this, uh, or do you just want to leave it to the three of us to decide the fate of trash and Hopkins? Are you planning on voting on the 21st? or I'm just asking having, if, getting... you, if you want us to try and extend this. Uh, I'd like to have a say in this since I've been at all the meetings up to this point. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like okay. to have a say. I agree. Okay, so given that fact, uh, that these two gentlemen would like to be in on the 21st when they can't be in on the 21st, what can we do? Staff will have a conversation with EL Harvey uh, taking into consideration that the two members will not be available on the 21st. And that we would need to extend the contract so that we could keep our services in town as they are today until we have such time as we can get everybody together, get the public in here, and have that hearing with everybody present. Can you make that happen? We... Dramatic we pause. Staff, yeah. We <laughs> He's got to talk to Harvey yeah. to see if he can say, make it happen. No, I can't make that happen. <laughs> yeah. We as, as staff will not put the community at risk. We will do whatever is possible to make sure that the... The service is not put at risk. Okay. Mrs. Wright. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be possible and advisable to still schedule the public hearing for June 21st and have the board vote later when the other members can be present because they are able to watch the public hearing comment by watching the video. And I do believe that as we get into July, people get away on vacations, it becomes less... It becomes harder for the public to participate. Um, I, I, I feel that for public input, um, you get, you might get more people able to come in June. Okay, Mr. Sestari, Mr. Catino, any thoughts on that suggestion? I'd still like to be part of the public hearing. Again, I've been we've been talking about this for six months, and uh, I, I don't want to miss out on people actually asking the questions and hearing some of the answers given. What about the idea of watching the presentation, taped HCAM presentation when he return or? I'm amenable to that. Um, Is that all right? Mr. Ted Stone. Well, I have a, I don't know at what point that I would talk about this, but um, I've spoken to Mr. Kamalo about this, and I've, I've gotten a bunch of um, feedback from the public. The um, problem that I have on this entire process is that there's one company presenting three options. Uh, I'd like it to go out to, a, uh, to bid to have all the trash companies in the area that are interested put an RFP together and find a way to maybe save us uh, some money. 
I know through speaking to Mr. Kamalu that uh, Harvey's is amenable to uh, pushing our contract out, keeping it kind of status quo for right now. Um, so for me and for speaking through uh, uh, a bunch of people that I've spoken to for, of town residents and, and voting members, it just doesn't, this whole thing doesn't kind of, if I can just throw a slang term, I was uh, past the smell test, that there's only one company that's, that's uh, bid it. And I know that Mr. Kamalu and, and Mr. Westling have done a lot of work on this, um, but uh, trash over the last three years, I've spoke to a, a, the owner of a, another trash company in, in, uh, that lives in town. He said that prices have come down you know, 15 to 25 to 40 percent over the last three years. And um, uh, as much as I love seeing these carts and, and things like that, not speaking for me, speaking for the townspeople, um, I'd like to see it go out to bid to see if we can, if this four million dollar contract can maybe get cut down and, and uh, save the townspeople uh, a bunch more money. Okay. I don't know if this is the time to bring that up or not, and I don't know what the board's thought is on that, but that's, uh, you know. That's I think it's the right time as we're trying to figure out sort of what the process is going to be to address this going forward. Let me ask a question to the town manager. When the previous board met and discussed this, did we vote to continue with E.L. Harvey and Sons, or did we just have a discussion? The reason I ask is now we're getting into Robert's rules here a little bit about whether we can revisit a vote or I'm just being hypersensitive. Yeah, I'll have to check my notes whether this was a consensus um, discussion or an actual vote by the board. If it was a vote by the board, then we'd have to have, I'm not sure how we do that because who made the motion has to reopen and it just gets. Well, and the second, uh, you know, the second has to remove the second, whoever made the motion, yeah, all right. the people who voted have to be present. It, I, I'm not it. sure if it's a feasible feat. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have to do that, but I understand, you're, you're right. That's what I'm, what I'm thinking about as you bring it up. Um, I'd also, I'd also add, you know, and I'm, first of all, I think that, I think putting things out to competitive bid, you know, when, when you can or when, when you think it makes sense is a good idea uh, from a business standpoint. But I'd also like to add that there are a lot of services we get from um, various contractors and service providers, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, our insurance or, you know, trash pickup or, you know, any number of other things that, you know, from year to year, there are times where we do put things out to bid and other times where we, uh, you know, just continue to renegotiate with our current provider. Um, and there can be different reasons, you know. I mean, I know that in, in my time working with Mr. Kamalo, uh, you know, sometimes with insurance, for example, it's, okay, you know, every three years or so, it makes sense to, you know, put this thing out to bid and see what's out there and see if we can do any better. Um, and so to, to, do, to do everything every year at the end of every contract, you know, sometimes it, it ends up spinning more cycles. I'm not saying this is one of those times. You know, I'm just saying that for consideration as, as you know, we're taking these things up as we go along. Yep. And through the, some of the legwork that I've done, I know that we haven't had this gone out to bid for like six, seven years anyways. Mm -hmm. And um, ideally, what I would love to see happen, I, I love the Harveys. Um, I'd love to see it go out to bid and see everyone's hard work come to fruition and say this was the best deal that we could get because then we have seamlessness and, and the transition will be, you know, uh, very minimal. But if company A, which is not Harvey's, comes in at $3 million and we have a chance to save a million and a half dollars over the next three years, and but in turn we have to buy our own barrels. <clears throat> I don't foresee that to be much of an issue. Um, and I know that Harvey's does a lot. Like in speaking to Mr. Kamalu, you know they have the recycling center. They have the program where they'll come out to your house and pick up your large ticket items to get rid of. Um, and there's a whole bunch of intangible stuff that that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis by these people. But um, 
I don't foresee any any of these companies that are bidding it. If you said that to the same, ask them to do the same level of service that Harvey's. I don't think Harvey's is a, you know, like a necessarily a gold standard. Like everyone aspires to be like Harvey's. I think they just aspire to pick up the trash and and get it recycled and, and do the right thing. Um, I have a feeling that all the other companies out there would be willing. Will, it's a sub, substantial contract. I have a feeling that all the companies out there would be willing to do the same services. And then let's see what they have for prices. If they uh, if they're within you know x amount of dollars, then stay with Harvey's. Um, but I just well, once you open the can of worms, and I don't I don't know if you have I don't know if you have the option of within x amount of dollars, then you go with one or the other. I think it's kind of a low bid. Yeah. Or whatever other With system, comparable services. yeah, whatever other system you set up, you know, where you have a grading system, you know, you could have price be one component, and then the ability to deliver, to, to deliver, you know, these other services, each one carry a certain weight, yep. and then have some formula to tally it all up, and whoever comes in with comes at the highest mark. You know, gets the bid. So I just want to clarify the magnitude of the contract that we're talking about. There's different numbers, and I don't have the budget in front of me, so I, I apologize. What is the magnitude of what we're looking at here in terms of dollars, Mister? Uh, I see, and, and this is kind of where I was thinking. Six seven. There's six or seven hundred thousand dollars. Is that? Can you just walk us through what these numbers are, real quick? Just. Not detailed numbers, but what's the matter? Uh, Mr. Tedstone mentioned $4 million. Yeah, we will give you the numbers in one second. Um, Through the chair, I, I have that information. I'm happy to share that. I'm a little sensitive to sharing it since this may go out to a public bid, but it, these, these numbers are, are public anyway. So that's, a, that's a good point. In it was so, published in the Independent. Yeah. So the, if, we, if we keep status quo, we're talking about $3.47 million over five years. If we go with auto, full automation, we're talking about $3.42 million over five years. And finally, if we do a hybrid, which is automated recycling but manual trash, is $3.41 million. Okay. So this is a five-year contract, a five-year proposal. And I guess sort of wearing my business hat for a second the, cost, the time value of money in renegotiating with somebody else, in my view, because you divide it by five, you're looking at seven, the $700,000 give or take number in my head. Um, you're, you're, you're getting down to some small dollars, right, on an annual fiscal year basis perspective. Um, I think that's kind of was one of the things that we talked about in the previous board in staying with them is what could we really save if we throw open the doors and start a process but how much time are we going to spend in his salary and his salary and somebody else's salary and everything else to pick up 18 grand? Yep. You know, I'm, believe me, I'm one to chase 18 grand wherever I can in town government, but there's a time value of money that you also have to throw into that mix. So from my perspective, I don't see the opportunity for improvement to be such that going out and opening the can of worms is going to save us, at the end of the day, a whole lot of money. And I think it's going to create a lot of aggravation uh, that I think could flow down to the actual residents and what happens at their curbside too. Okay, that's just one one person's opinion. I think it's unfortunate that you know because of the election process and all that this item is being raised at the eleventh hour. Um, perhaps it would be a good policy going forward. You know, as a contract comes up for renewal earlier on, to discuss whether. Things should be sent out for bid, and if you know we've been with one contractor for a long period of time, maybe it's time to just take a fresh look. But um, this is really late in the game. Could be a charter review item. <laughs> <laughs> trash. <laughs> trash. <laughs> Subsection five dash three. Trash. trash. <laughs> Not trash, but contract contracts with external out there vendors for a long time. <laughs> that you know, on a certain yeah. period, period over a certain review. amount per year, and yeah, periodic yeah, review. Something, yeah. And I don't mean to downplay all the work that, that these guys have done. I've had a, a couple of long conversations with Mr. Kamalo about it. And like we talk about in the next couple of years, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're going to have to absorb quite a bit of, um, of money tax-wise. Um, I'd like to 
you know, if I can proactively tighten the belt a little bit, then great. And if the board doesn't see that that's that that has uh, value, then I'm fine with that too. Um, in this process, we are legally allowed to continue with Harvey, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we are legally allowed to negotiate with Harvey, correct? That is correct. So in, in my world during the day, on occasion, I will say to a supplier or a business partner, if I were to go out and bid this thing, what would I get back from you and your competitors? And a good supplier or partner is going to fess up and tell you what those numbers might look like. Have we had that question too? So, so instead of doing exactly what he is suggesting, but we have that conversation to truly understand what the market is. Has the market dropped 20 or 30 percent in the last couple of years for collection and, and redistribution of trash? That sounds like a huge drop to me. I'm wondering if the value of reselling some of the product that's recycled has dropped 20 or 30 percent, but not the value of the collection itself. So, I mean, if we had that conversation with Harvey, like, okay, we're under some pressure in Hopkinton to rebid this thing. If we do this, what are we going to see? And where are you guys? And why are you, know, are you competitive? Are you going to be competitive in that situation? Yes, we have had that conversation with E.L. Harvey, as well as with our state coordinator for waste collection and management. As well as what? Our state representative on waste collection and management. Uh, we do have Massachusetts has coordinators uh, on, for these kinds of contracts. Okay. And our contact is Kathy Miza, based out of Norwood now. And we, we have had extensive conversations with her in terms of what is she seeing in terms of numbers uh, on contracts in other communities. And is she comfortable with the numbers that we're talking about or proposed numbers for the different options in front of us? Yes, she is. And I say, I say that respectfully of uh, Ian Harvey. Okay, so that's kind of what, okay. you know, what I'm thinking there's a little bit of due diligence in that mindset, in that process, without shifting gears wholly. Um, I didn't know about this state representative. I thought you were talking about Ms. Dekema for a minute there. No, she's a, she's a coordinator. Okay. Uh, hey, are we obligated to go through that person? She's, she's offered as a resource. As a resource, she provides technical advice, similar to if we're working on land use related issues and we work with MA, MAPC. Uh, she's the equivalent of that. Hmm. And yeah, and I'll just I'll just say I'm I'm not sure you might not have been at the meeting when we were discussing this a few months ago when we were trying to figure out uh, you know that the uh, option had come up about putting this out to bid or continuing discussions with Harvey and that very topic came up that we do have a state level coordinator who gives you uh, you know an idea of what the bids are looking like these days for a town of our size you know on a on a you know, per residence kind of basis. And, um, you know, Mr. Kamala was, was telling us that the numbers looked like they were tracking right in line with that. Um, and that's why, you know, we felt comfortable with continuing with Harvey and continuing the relationship we've had. You know, at that time, we also told Mr. Kamala as he was continuing the conversations, if they started to veer away from uh, what that com those comfortable numbers were, um, then we needed to revisit it. So, okay. Does that make you feel any better? No, not especially. I'm kind of thick-headed when it comes to that, but I'll go with whatever the board says. Okay. Anybody else on the board thinking about a full rebid process? Okay. So we're going to table that for now, if that's all right. It's fine. If if we go down a path and that path starts to look a little crazy, then we can talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, okay. So that aside for the moment, moving forward, we're going to have a pub, I think we're going to have a public hearing on the 21st. We're going to have the trash cans on display between, can we have these for a while now? We've got them. Pretty much. We have these trash cans here for a display. We should just line them up right here for the next couple of weeks. Um, we can have that whole discussion and presentation that you had. I think we should allow an hour for this, frankly, a 20-minute discussion and 40 minutes for public input. Uh, I think that's, it warrants that kind of time. Uh, and then you guys can watch that upon your return. And then um, we'll try to get to some kind of resolution. 
in our July meeting. Um, so that would require that our relationship with Harvey continue uh, as is until we get to some kind of discussion or decision. What's the date of the July meeting so that we can make sure that Mr. Catino uh, is available? 12. Yeah. July 12th. Okay. Everybody good with that general process and timeline? Mr. Westling, did you want to share anything with us? To, I'm sorry, Mr. Kamal. Yes. Um, if, if, the, if the chair agrees, um, we would like to share with the board what we have had so far from the community in terms of the feedback, as well as some of the conversations that we have had with E.L. Harvey and the likely adjustments uh, to some of the concepts that we've touched on in the past. Okay, so you want to do that here for a few minutes? Yes, we can do that okay. very quickly. We're going to close tonight at 10 o'clock, regardless, because we're, we're going to run a little behind here, but we're going to close at 10 o'clock either way. So, Mr. Westling, if you want to take like seven minutes and walk us through what you know so far, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will uh, focus on the, the comments that we've heard from the community. If you have other questions or comments, please let me know. When we did the presentation with the, the larger buckets, uh, carts, 96-gallon uh, for recyclables and the 64-gallon for trash, we had several comments from people that thought that that was either <coughs> too large or would be too heavy to move. So we, we spoke with E.L. Harvey, and E.L. Harvey has the option of the smaller 36-gallon. So for those folks that, that can't perhaps move them to the, to the curb or they've got a long <coughs> distance to move them, we have options, and Neil Harvey is willing to work with us on, on those options. We also heard from some folks that didn't want to use the carts for any number of reasons. Either they keep the trash in their basement and they couldn't carry the carts in and out. Uh, they don't have room to store the carts, uh, those type of things. And we spoke with E.L. Harvey, and E.L. Harvey is willing to roll out the program and those folks that want to opt out of it can opt out of it for whatever their personal reasons are. They can opt out of it. E.L. Harvey will make accommodations to collect their trash and recyclables from the 32-gallon barrels that they may be using today or other barrels. So in, in, in summary, what we heard from the community is <coughs> what are the opportunities for flexibility in this program? There will be flexibility in terms of cut size. There will also be flexibility in terms of participation. What we have discussed so far with E.L. Harvey is that in terms of recycling, we would like to propose for the board's consideration rolling out the program townwide. Similarly, with the trash, we are suggesting rolling out the program townwide however, with the ability uh, for the residents to opt out. And those that would opt out would basically opt back to what they have today. Correct. That's correct. That's the length of the contract. So, from our discussions, is for the length of the contract. Um, discussing the broad concepts, and this can be negotiated uh, as we finalize the contract. Opt out or opt in? Opt. He, he's, he <laughs> out then in. Yeah, we, we, we discussed this issue at length uh, <laughs> yeah, this morning. The idea is the program is rolled out, yeah. and we give the community some length of time to call in and say they are not interested. So it's not a matter of us rolling the cuts to your yard and saying, hey, these are your cuts or else. <laughs> Find no. a place for it. Exactly. <laughs> we will give the community the time to call either DPW or call EA Harvey and say they want to opt out. And, okay. and through the chair, that primarily comes from the fact, the flexibility comes from the fact that the trucks aren't going to change on the streets 
it's the way that the trash is collected. There's an arm that comes out, it's going to grab the trash, it's going to dump it. So that makes it much more efficient for them. The trucks are on the street for less time. They have less slip and fall from the drivers getting out of the trucks. They have less back problems from the drivers lifting the heavy barrels. But because the trucks are the same on the street, E.L. Harvey can be flexible. And for those few folks or a number, however many folks there are that want to use their old system, the driver can still get out. It will still minimize the, the, so, the claims. So if somebody already has a heavy-duty barrel that looks just like these without the Harvey sign on the side, it's, it's achieving the same, the same goal. Absolutely correct. And uh, through the chair, as long as the, the, the barrels are sturdy enough, and most of them are when you buy them at this size, mm -hmm. and they can be grabbed and dumped, uh, E.L. Harvey will make accommodations to use the existing barrels. Yeah. OK. okay. Mr. Kamal, sorry. Yes. The I appreciate you looking at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other piece of new information we want to share with the board is we're always looking for opportunities to find savings for the community. We have identified in our conversations with our coordinator um, a state grant that could potentially bring back to the town about $45,000. There is a grant program where, strictly with recycling, the state can pay back to the community through a grant at $10 for each barrel. In our negotiations with E.L. Harvey, we have been pretty firm on the fact that if we are successful, um, if we are successful applying for that grant, that that benefit will inure to this community. Hmm. That is correct. And to, to further that, there's a requirement for the grant that the barrels become the property of the community at the end of the five-year contract, and Yale Harvey was amenable to that as well. So they would purchase them. We would pay $10 towards the cost. At the end of the contract, they would become property of the town. And then, so the homeowners that have these barrels, like say Mr. Catino has a fancy... 64 gallon barrel that he wants to use himself and then the first time Harvey's came and grabbed it and dumped it broke it in half is that the homeowner's responsibility or is that going to be the through the chair that's an excellent question the barrels will be purchased and owned by E.L. Harvey through the term of the contract mm -hmm. if a lid pops off if a wheel pops off if they get cracked E.L. Harvey's responsible to come out and either repair it or replace it as necessary that was but, an but excellent question, comment to an excellent question. However, yeah. the question was, if exactly. it's your own barrel if it's and Harvey's barrel. breaks it, yes. then it, you get a new it, one from Harvey. Exactly. But it looks like that. The answer to that question so far is that Harvey has only committed to maintaining and funding the barrels that they provide. Right. But if you're using your own and then it breaks, it's logical that they would then give you the one that's been and Then you opt in, you call up and, and you, you opt in. in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, 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 I know Mr. Chair, we're looking at time. There are other aspects of this, of, of the discussions with E.L. Harvey that I, I want the board to be aware of. As in the past, the overflow bags continue to be part of this program. As in the past, bulk items, white metals, town's ability to access the recycling center remain part of the converse, conversation. In addition, there are several other things that we have also found to be of immense benefit to the community. If we proceed with the conversations with E.L. Harvey, we hope that the contract will reflect the following. As in the past, the town will not be responsible for paying any additional fee based on the increase in the number of households in town. This is a fixed contract. Mm. Number two, we went to town meeting and the town approved the dog park. In our discussions with E.L. Harvey, we have said and asked E.L. Harvey to be responsible for taking care of the waste from the dog park at no additional cost to the town. We have also argue with that one. <laughs> Are they going to do the collection of that waste? Yes. Okay, yes. let's stay focused, yes. please. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Because I started it. My fault. <laughs> in, in addition... Everyone will take the waste. It's in, compost. Yeah. In, in addition, 
There are, there, are, there are three other key drivers in the cost of waste management in town, one being the, the cost of fuel. We have been pretty clear in our conversations that this contract will not, will, will not be adjusted based on whether the fuel prices go up or not. The second piece is with regard to um, the income from the recycling component. Uh, most towns, if there's a change in the price of paper, it goes down, as we all know now, the price of paper has gone down. Towns end up paying more for recycling. We don't have that in our contract. We will maintain this as a fixed, fixed contract. Um, the public education, as we have heard from the Hopkinton Sustainable Green Committee, uh, it's important that we continue to uh, have the provider responsible for the cost of educating the public with regards to recycling, uh, waste management, and so forth. EL Half will continue to do that. And finally, as I mentioned before, during the construction of the DPW facility, we will, have, we will not have access to our fuel depot. There are several fuel depots in town. Uh, we have made discussion of access to Harvey's fuel depot part of this discussion. Granted, yes, we can talk to other entities here in town for that facility too. Okay. All right, so what I see developing here is we're headed down a path, although we've not decided anything. We're headed down a path where we're going to go to single stream recycling. We're going to go to automated single stream recycling pickup as well as automated trash pickup. We're going to have uh, a, a uniform program that gets rolled out across the community, but those homes where it doesn't work for whatever reason are going to have the ability to opt out and return back to what they know and work with today. And um, I think that's summer. And sorry, and we're going to get together again on uh, uh, June 21st for an hour to talk about this in a public hearing format with the community. And then we're going to make a decision, uh, hopefully, in early July, specific to an implementation. Is that a fair representation of where we are? That's not an absolute answer. That's not the final decision. That is no decision. That's just what we're headed towards. Um, but I think a lot of the questions that I heard when I attended the forum last Tuesday evening have been addressed based on what you're discussing this evening and the fact that people can opt back to what they have today. So I think we're headed in the right direction. I'm sure we'll get some more feedback, and I'd encourage the community to continue to send us that feedback. It's been very helpful as I think about the issue and as I'm sure as everyone else thinks about the issue. But for right now, I'd encourage us to table it until the 21st when we have the public hearing. Everybody good? Okay. Good. John, thank you very much for your input tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members and, of the board. Uh, Appreciate you bringing your props. Okay, uh, that concludes uh, the major agenda items for us this evening. We have left, real quick, board liaison assignments, board invites for board liaison assignments. Click here. So in your packet, uh, we have the liaison um, list. But Mr. Kamal, I'd like to table that until the next meeting. Uh, if anybody has a strong opinion about where they want to go and where they don't want to go, please share with the town manager or his team before our next meeting. Uh, and we'll spend a little bit more time on that at our next meeting, okay? We won't get through that this evening and get out of here at 10 o'clock. Yeah, so just tell us where you want to go and we'll make it work. But just tell us before you're, you know what I mean? Just let us know where you want to go and we'll make it work. Okay, so we're going to hold off on that. Um, does anybody have any liaison reports to make from previous assignments or other stuff going on in town? Mr. Sestari. Nothing. All right, Mrs. Wright. Yep, I don't have any. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Catino. I went to the uh, marathon uh, closing, closing ceremonies or something to that effect. It was, that was, uh, it was a very, very nice event. Uh, at uh, Laborers, it was uh, well attended. Uh, we saw that Mary Pratt was there. Yep. That was a, it was a, it was a fun event. And uh, thank you to everybody that uh, helped with the marathon. It was really, it was a, it was a real success this year. And uh, look forward to another one next year. Great. The only thing I have is this Sunday they have Fireman Sunday, 
at the fire station. So I'm uh, I'm planning on going there either as a an old dog firefighter or uh, as a representative of the selectmen. So if we don't have anyone that's going as a selectman, I'd be happy to represent us. If we do have someone going, I gotta go get a bigger uniform. <laughs> um, great. If you can go, that would be great. Uh, anything else? So I don't have anything as far as liaisons go. Um, there have been a few events in town that we've scattered amongst us. We've been all been to attending. Uh, I think uh, all's good in that regard. Um, town manager's report. We're moving this ahead, so that's going to keep you busy. Trash is going to keep you busy for a while. Okay, so you're good? Okay, future board agenda items. Mr. Sestari. Uh, nothing at this time. Okay. Nope. So future board agenda item, Mr. Kamalo. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where we are with the HCA and uh, their application process for a license. Last I heard, they were going to come back. Um, I don't, haven't seen anything yet come across my desk or desktop, for that matter, specific to that. Um, I think there's some things going on specific to the HCA that we want to help them sort through so that we can make this happen somehow, some way, in a way that works for all in town, but we need to be able to talk to them and make it happen. And I don't want to get too far down a path here and, and not set something up because I'm concerned about how that might impact uh, the long-term viability of this whole pro uh, approach. Yes, I, I can assure the board that uh, we are actively engaged the HCA. Uh, there are various uh, components to the discussion, and the HCA is also looking at its its, its options uh, okay. relative to how they will proceed. Good. Yeah, we want it, we want to make this work somehow, some way, but we've got to have a dialogue and get that get it on our agenda. Okay. Anything else? So with that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Wait, I just have one I'm sorry, Mrs. Wright. One remark. Um, I know that we've got a good chunk of time set aside for the public hearing on the trash issue. I do think it's been well covered in the HCAM process and what went on here tonight for those watching at home. Um, I would recommend if we have the, depending on what else is on that agenda, we might have less public input than takes an hour if there's any way that we can avoid putting another public hearing after that. So. That you know, we don't have, we have less than an hour's worth of public hearing, and now we have to wait the full hour for the next public hearing. So maybe we can schedule that so that if there is less than an hour's worth, we can move ahead with the rest of the agenda. Yeah, I, un unfortunately, I, I believe we already have our liquor license applications. The board has a fixed time period within which to act on those licenses. But we'll try and arrange it yeah. in such yes. a way. Oh, yeah. I understand that. I just mean when you put another when you schedule a public hearing, public hearing has to happen at that designated time. Yeah. So if we put another public hearing after the trash one, and it, we don't encompass a whole hour for trash, now we're waiting for the public. So if there's a way that we can avoid putting another public hearing, not public meeting, but a public hearing, so that we're not willing our heels. Mr. Sestari like and I are smiling at each other because I, I guarantee you it's going to go a full hour. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, you know, it's, I, if it, I, 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 I would love to be told I'm wrong, but I, 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 I suspect it will go a full yeah. hour. In, in fact, Seligman Wright, I, I like your comment. We've discussed this before. The board has, has had a different opinion. There are other institutions that, that schedule pub, public hearings five minutes after the others for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm this board is wrong. not interested. In that. We'll see what else is on. That's a great point. Yeah. We'll see what else is on. But yeah. I, whatever time we should lot for trash, I think it'll be. We'll take it. Okay. It will be taken. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, board chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, aye. aye. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody.